But um, for now, I would like to pass it over to open the event uh, to Mr. Peter Schmidt, uh, President of the European Economic and Social Committee's uh, math section, um, to say a few words and to, to welcome us as this is being hosted by the European Economic and Social Committee. So, Mr. Schmidt, if you'd yeah, like to take Thank you. Up. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the introduction. And uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to welcome you all ladies and gentlemen and uh, dear colleagues for this final event, uh, which is, as you already said, Daniel, uh, co-organized uh, um, uh, together with uh, uh, Rubisma and Life Brewer. Um, we are happy to co uh, organize this, uh, this event. Um, and I want to tell you why we are happy uh, to, to co-organize and to be part of this development, because this subject, is one of our key priorities in uh, our NUT section. And uh, allow me please to make you a bit familiar with the ESC, with the uh, European Economic and Social, Social Committee. The European Economic and Social Committee is the house of civil society. So we represent, represent um, a, a, a large number of different stakeholders in different areas, whether it comes from the industry or goes into rural, into rural areas with farmers organizations and so on. So we are composed in three groups, employers, trade unions, and so-called various interest groups. I myself come from the, from the trade union um, uh, group, and we have a kind of convening power, which says that we are able to organize opinions and make compromises, but meaningful compromises. So that means we come together, we organize these opinions, and in this opinion making, we have different um, op opportunities to target issues. This, in this case, my, um, in my section, the NAT section um, for, for rural development, for food systems uh, in charge of uh, um, sustainable development, we launched recently an own initiative opinion, opinion um, following the long years work which we have done over the years on the development of rural of rural areas, and um, and we 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 said we have to organize it a bit more holistically rather than we did before. So that's why we launched this own initiative opinion, and we are quite happy that is uh, so timely and ties in perfectly in that uh, what uh, what you have been uh, doing in the last uh, in the last years. I don't want to go into details of this of this opinion because my colleague uh, friend uh, Piroš Kakalai uh, will have uh, later the floor and explain a bit more on, the, on, this, on this content. That's why give me uh, uh, the chance to, to set a couple of things which I think is very, very important to, to discuss. The first thing is we, we must discuss a well-being economy for Europe. That means we must have a specific view on the development um, in, 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 in remote or in rural areas. And bring this two areas, urban and rural together, because we think the one can't live without the, the, other, the other area. So that means we, we must really see that we have equal, equal um, chances for people living in rural areas, and of course in, rural, uh, in, in urban areas, Give you an example. My, I live in an, in a rural area, and uh, for me, it's quite clear. I pay the same taxes, but I have less service in comparison to people living in living in rural rural areas. We do not have in, enough uh, a service on, on on public transport, for instance, healthcare service, and uh, I, all these things. We have to really uh, have a deeper look and see how we can uh, develop that. The future of Europe is decided on the rural on the rural areas. And for this, I think it is really timely and worth that we discussed it. I'm happy to open this uh, today's event. Welcome you all again. And I'm really happy and keen to see what is the outcome of, the, of the today's uh, debate. Thank you very much. And back to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith, uh, for the welcome address. And uh, particularly the last point that you left us with there was, um, saying that the future of Europe will be decided by rural areas. I think that's very, uh, 
important, very poignant, and uh, of course we will try to build on that in the discussions that take place uh, in the next sessions. So now um, we can move to uh, our introduction from uh, Alexia Ruby from uh, the Director General, uh, Director General uh, Agriculture and Rural Development of the European Commission, um, just to set the scene maybe a bit uh, for us. And um, yeah, pass over there, Alexia. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm trying to share a screen, but I'm not uh, allowed now. Just one moment, we can fix that. Should okay. be able to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address the, 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 the conference today. Um, I'm very happy to be to be here and trying to talk to, to you uh, a bit about uh, the, the subject of rural businesses in the European Green Deal and in the uh, EU rural vision to set the scene for this uh, important final event. So just also to breach with the previous conference of, uh, of Rubismo also in the, in the European Economic and Social Committee some years ago. Uh, I'd like to recall, start again from the words that President van der Leyen used in 2019 in her political guidelines to introduce the launch of the long-term vision for rural areas. And you can see in the words that she used that for her, rural areas are not only about landscapes and, 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 and green and recreation, but also very much about the economy. She said, our rural areas are the fabric of our society and the heartbeat of our economy. Uh, she mentioned landscape, uh, culture and heritage uh, as one of the uh, Europe's most defining and remarkable features, and that they are a core part of our identity and our economic potential. Um, and, and he also said we would invest in the future of rural areas. So the, the aim of the long-term vision for rural areas was really to look at uh, the role these areas uh, have to play in the future uh, of, uh, of, of Europe um, and to discuss it together with rural and urban people, with, with all the European citizens and really make rural areas part of this, uh, an integral part of this future. Um, so, and, and, and the very first also priority for the future is the European Green Deal. Uh, so, and, and, and this long-term vision for rural areas in the beginning was part of the Green Deal and then was uh, uh, rather put in the framework of the work on, on demography and democracy because of the importance of people uh, in it. Uh, but it's very, he it has really uh, feet a bit uh, on, on both sides. And, and the European Green Deal is, uh, as you know, uh, Europe's strategy to become climate neutral by 2050. Uh, but it's also very much a strategy to transform the economy uh, to make that possible. And it spans across all sectors of, of uh, European economy. And some of uh, the initiatives that are in there are very important for rural areas, like the farm to fork strategy, for example, the biodiversity strategy, but also energy is very important for rural areas, uh, issues around pollution, uh, climate emissions, um, um, but also financing green projects, for example, or ensuring uh, most of all a just transition for all, because rural areas are not necessarily in the same position to uh, embark into these transitions than uh, urban areas. They have other opportunities, but also other challenges. Um, so it's good that we have this as a context to look at, a bit at, at, at rural businesses. So how did we develop the long-term vision for rural areas? There were three streams of work. Uh, a very important one was a public consultation. It had to be a vision that, was, that came from the people and not only from, from Brussels. We've had made a lot uh, of analysis and you can see in the documents some specific chapters on economic development, bioeconomy, innovation, and also climate, environment, and ecosystem services. And there was also a foresight dimension as this is a vision, a long-term vision by 2040. Uh, and we have developed a number of scenarios considering also as a dimension of these scenarios, various roles for, for rural economies. The result has been published at the end of June this year uh, and includes really a, a series of documents, a communication from the commission, uh, a staff working document, which is quite long with all this analysis I mentioned, uh, what the EU policies are doing also for rural areas and this foresight uh, element. There's also a synopsis report of the public consultation and a fact sheet to bring it to, into two pages if, uh, uh, for people to have a really quick glance. So you can find all these documents uh, with the link that is below here. And I'm just going to go across, uh, go over some elements that are more interesting for today. So what did we see in that 
analysis uh, in these chapters I mentioned as main challenges for rural businesses. Uh, access to labor is certainly a, a very uh, important one. Uh, we have, uh, on average, older population in rural areas, so less working age. There's a selective out-migration of women and, and, and young uh, uh, people and more difficulties for them to, to find employment as well. There's still a lower GDP per capita, although the situation is improving uh, a bit. Uh, and access to services, infrastructures, uh, enabling conditions for innovation, uh, education, all of these are weaker in rural areas, which is a problem for businesses as well. And connectivity uh, um, in general, both uh, digital and physical uh, are, are is, is, is also lower, especially so access to broadband has improved a lot, but access to the latest generation, uh, the fastest internet, which is necessary for businesses to be on a competing ground, uh, is a bit, uh, uh, is, is lagging behind. Uh, and one important thing that was at the point of departure of the work of the vision was also the feeling of being overlooked uh, or not considered uh, on par with the other parts of, uh, with the more urban parts of, of Europe. And we could verify that that is the case, especially for the most remote, uh, uh, the most remote uh, uh, areas more prominently for for these so, which means it may be difficult for businesses in these remote areas to attract uh, to attract also uh, 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 employees for example uh, but uh, on the other side on the other side of the coin there are a lot of opportunities that are that come and it come especially for from the green transition from the green deal uh, the rural areas are really the place uh, that matter uh, for the delivery of ecosystem services for all citizens, rural and urban. This is the place for the development of the bioeconomy and the circular economy uh, that is uh, called for uh, as a replacement for, to the fossil fuel economy. Um, and, and in general, these ecological, green and digital transitions, they have a lot to bring uh, as opportunities to rural uh, areas because of all the economic um, uh, prospects that they bring, but also because digital can can lower the, the, the distances and can improve the access to markets and the access to people. Uh, um, and um, and it offers uh, a potential way out of this of these challenges. On top of that, we're seeing increasing demands from society for, for sustainable food, for recreational spaces, especially with the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, the perception of rural areas has clearly changed and, and evolved uh, in, in, more, in a positive sense. Uh, more people are looking for, uh, towards living in rural areas and working from there now that it becomes more easily feasible with the new ways of working. And so there are opportunities there. And in general, uh, in, in the way the recovery from the COVID crisis is happening, it could offer a lot of opportunities for rural areas and for rural businesses in particular. So it's really dual sided. Um, I wanted to bring you some some figures on, on the rural economy as well to frame a bit the importance of uh, because it's often we debate the importance of agriculture versus other sectors. So what were the findings that so this is the share of employment and uh, and the share of gross uh, value added. Uh, blue is agriculture, uh, forestry and fishery, industry and construction is in orange and services are are in gray. So we can see that especially in some countries and uh, more to the, towards the east of, of Europe, agriculture uh, forestry and fisheries are still a very important part of, of, of the economy, but the other sectors also represent a lot. Huh? And it, it's good to have this in mind. And of course, the primary sector is the backbone of all the of, of, of a lot of the other sectors, but uh, the economy is clearly um, uh, more diverse than, than this. And um, and still diversifying. So on, on the right hand side there, we look at the evolution between 2000 and 2018 of both employment and growth value added. And we can see there that uh, uh, services in particular and, and industry in some countries uh, is, is more where the evolution is taking place. Uh, and so we have to take that into, a, into account when we look at rural businesses. Um, we asked during the public consultation, uh, we asked people what are the components uh, that the EU long-term strategy for rural areas and action plan should have uh, to, to, to improve the situation of rural areas. And job creation, innovation and entrepreneurship 
clearly came as the first, the very first response. I mean, three quarters of respondents said uh, that's that's important. Uh, and then it was completed by a lot of other things. Position two and three are infrastructure and connectivity, as I said. But also, if you look, the fourth response is achieving climate, energy, and biodiversity targets. So people clearly understand this as a key component of a vision and a strategy for the future of rural areas. And here you see the link with the Green Deal as well. And came as well things like improving links between urban and rural areas, strengthening local rural productive networks, more coordination, networking of actions, so cooperation, cooperation, improving accessibility to quality housing as well. Huh? No businesses if people cannot live where they, where they, where they work. Um, so this is really um, interesting to see uh, a bit how uh, the number of responses that these different components uh, got. The green economy, uh, if if you link this to, is is what comes out more was prominently. Um, I, I, I extracted also some quotes from the Rural Voices, so that was an, 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 uh, um, an initiative uh, done by the European Network for Rural Development of collecting um, stakeholder views through workshops they were invited to, to organize themselves so through a stakeholder kit, um, and uh, just extracting some ideas that came from these Rural Voices. Uh, people saw uh, really an interest in uh, improving, for example, the market recognition of the value uh, of products and the regional identity of, 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 of goods and services, uh, especially those bio-based. Um, they saw scope uh, to improve access to new markets to digital technologies. Uh, they saw potential in regional community energy systems. Uh, in new models to support entrepreneurship and innovation. So things like incubators, hubs, networks came a lot. We need to connect. There are less people and less businesses in rural areas. So we need to connect them to one another and to networks also cooperate co to actors outside to improve their access to, to knowledge, innovation, services, markets. Um, they talked also about the emergence and reinvigoration of both traditional and new sectors, and maybe a lot of the innovation potential is in the connection between the two. And um, also, in general, uh, there were lots of comments on supporting commercial and social entrepreneurs, so both commercial and social, again, uh, and nurturing new ways of working, which can offer potential for rural areas. Um, a few words on foresight. Uh, so the foresight exercise was done by the ENRD uh, thematic group on on uh, on for the long-term vision on rural areas and the Joint Research Center. It was a participatory foresight that came up with four scenarios, and I think it's interesting for us today maybe to look at these and 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 question what does it mean for rural air, for rural businesses to operate within each of these four scenarios. What's the difference? And uh, the drivers that were uh, picked out to, 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 to see which different uh, future there could be uh, were the most important, those ranked by the group as most important and most uncertain. And these were rural demography, will areas expand or shrink in terms of population, and the quality of multi-level governance, whether it's fragmented, so different departments and levels of governance do not speak to one another, or it's networked, they, 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 they work together. Uh, this led to these four scenarios that you can see, rural vanities, rural renewal, rural connection, and rural spatialization uh, that are a bit different. I cannot enter into details today, but I, I warmly encourage you to read the report. And just a, a little uh, highlight on, on the rural businesses dimension. So under urbanities, where a lot of people move to rural areas, uh, but there's no real governance uh, um, arrangement that allows this to be <clears throat> properly coordinated, there are very diverse opportunities for entrepreneurs and SMEs um, <clears throat> of all kinds, but not really coordinated. Under the rural renewal scenario, there are also very diverse opportunities, but with a clear focus on circular, local and short supply chains. Under the rural connection scenarios where you have a good network multi-level governance, uh, but shrinking rural areas, their rural uh, people who stay in rural areas are more organized as hubs and, and agriculture is important as part of a circular economy, which is very well uh, managed. And in the quadrant on the bottom left, rural spatialization, there is really a scenario with a more urban centric perspective where the rural areas are here to supply <clears throat> the urban uh, uh, areas with uh, with goods and services 
and is there the economy is really highly specialized and consolidated as a large scale bioeconomy. So you can see a bit the, the different things that this can, this can mean for rural businesses. So what does the vision look like? Um, so we came up with a, <clears throat> a vision that really brings, uh, we know rural areas are very diverse and that's the same for rural businesses, but there's a lot of common ground. That's what emerged from the, all this work that I've just described. And so we came up with a vision uh, that, that highlights uh, the, the wish for rural areas by 2040 to be stronger, connected, resilient and prosperous. These are the four big areas of work. Uh, stronger means empowered communities, improved access to services and, and empowerment to innovate as well, so social innovation. Connected is about both digital and physical connectivity, so improving uh, also transport and mobility, and that could mean logistics also for, for rural uh, areas and rural businesses. Resilient is about both environmental and social resilience, so climate change, environment, uh, but also um, uh, around the, the capacity of communities to face social shocks and, 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 and there are gender aspects in there. And prosperous, finally, which is very important also for today, which is about the diversification of economic activities and sustainable food production. This vision uh, is also um, um, uh, structured into shared goals um, by, uh, tw by 2040. Sorry. Um, and so one of these shared goals is uh, that the rural people are entrepreneurial, innovative and skilled, co-creating technological and ecological and social progress. I'm, I'm sorry, but my phone doesn't want to stop. Okay. Um, very quickly, um, the Rural Action Plan um, accompanies the rural vision. So this is about what we are going to do at, at EU level. So there are uh, nine uh, flagship uh, actions proposed together with five accompanying actions. Uh, under Stronger, we propose to set up a rural revitalization platform uh, that will collect all the tools and examples uh, uh, that we have to uh, inspire rural communities on how they can, they can improve their situation. Uh, tools such as the ones that are produced by Rubismo and LiveRu could feed into this revitalization platform very much. There's also a flagship on research and innovation for rural communities, where the focus is on really innovation by and for rural communities, empowering everyone in rural areas to, to innovate uh, with a lot of support coming from Horizon Europe. Um, under Connected, we have uh, initiatives on uh, multimodal mob mobility for rural areas and rural digital futures uh, as well. Under Resilient, uh, there are initiatives around energy transition and fighting climate change, so supporting rural municipalities in that domain. Two actions that are more on the ecosystem services, so the climate action in peatland through carbon farming and the EU mission, um, which is now adopted. I should have changed that, so it's called now a soil deal for Europe, so the uh, soil mission that is here to improve the health of soils uh, everywhere. And there's a flagship on social resilience and women in rural areas. And finally, one which is quite central uh, for us today is the flagship on entrepreneurship and social economy in rural areas, which is here really to support the entrepreneurs and the SMEs uh, in, 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 in improving their, their businesses through networking, cooperation, coordination, uh, boosting social economy, business models, et cetera, et cetera. And last, and I'll end this because I'm over time, sorry for that. Uh, we have a number also of more cross-cutting actions on rural proofing. Um, uh, so making sure new legislation is adapted to the needs of rural, of rural areas, including businesses. Um, the Rural Observatory, which is here to centralize data and, and, and improve our knowledge of what's happening in rural areas. And also a toolkit to combine uh, on how to combine EU funds to better support the, the rural uh, uh, communities and economies. And last but not least, we will launch a rural pact, which is a framework for interaction between all levels of governance uh, and stakeholders on rural development, um, where uh, because the there are a number of things that depend on the EU level, but it's also the collective, uh, it has to be a collective endeavor to deliver this vision and where all the different levels of governance have a role to play and all different types of stakeholders have a role to play. And the idea is really to, to launch a process by which this would be nicely uh, coordinated and, and, and delivered. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that has set the scene and over to you, um, Daniel.
Thank you very much, Alexia. So we'll just get back the presentation. Um, but uh, it was very interesting to hear from you, uh, specifically about the rural scenarios uh, that you've seen and the, of course, the Commission's action plan towards us. I think uh, one thing that you said there about, um, I think there's long been an understanding that rural areas and the businesses are very different from one to another, but it's good to see that we've already you know, started to map out what are the commonalities and how can we, um, you know, we also need to move beyond that and say, you know, what do they have in common and what can we do together to, to uh, improve things and to connect things uh, a bit better. Um, so now I see the uh, screen has not come fully back. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's okay. We can move to our uh, coordinators from Rubisma and from Livru. Um, so that's David Heiser from Livru and uh, Justin Casimir from uh, uh, Rubisma. So uh, perhaps they can now take over with the introduction uh, and lay out uh, a bit of the overview of the projects. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Alexia and uh, Peter for the introduction. I think you, yeah, you, you did set the scene. Uh, you make it easy now for us to, to actually introduce very really briefly the, the projects and uh, give a lot of legitimation to the, to the project. Uh, yeah, my name is Justin Casimir. Uh, I've been coordinating the, still coordinating the Rubismo project. And I'm here with my colleague, David. Hello, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I'm David Heiser. I'm also uh, greeting everybody of you. I'm a coordinator of the Life World project, a sister project of Rubismo. We're very, very proud that we have made it so far. And we're very anxious to, to tell you a little bit about um, what either of our projects did. Um, we were on the same call. We had the same expected results. We had the same expected impact. We did it a little bit differently, I think. Uh, we had the same goal, but uh, I think we're going to show you a little bit about uh, our different approaches, very complement to what Alexia also said. So, um, yeah, first of all, just let me say thank you to everybody who has supported us. Uh, I think Justin will say the same because um, we have been 24 partners in the project uh, during the three and a half years of the project of 13 different countries, 11 different languages. It's, it's been interesting, it's been challenging. We have the wide net uh, spread and, and we had a great support specifically from the DG Agri, from the research and executive agency as well. So thank you for all of supporting us. And now we would like to show you a little bit what we did and, and hopefully get your interest peaked in our tools and our results and our opinions. And, and see what we did and how, how this can play into the rural vision uh, in the next decade. Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, I think I will, I will uh, follow you on, on thanking all the partners from Rubismo, all the stakeholders that were involved in the different uh, research activities, interviews. Uh, we are very sorry that we have been harassing you uh, with those interviews, but the, the results uh, were really interesting. Uh, so thanks again uh, for that. Um, yeah, indeed, we, we have basically 10 minutes to summarize three and a half years of, uh, of a journey. Um, so maybe we can start, as you say, we had the same, the same goal, but I think we, we used a slightly different journey. Um, could you tell us a bit more, David, what were the, the, main, um, the main approach of LIVRO? Absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, LIVRO was um, targeting basically the rural uh, innovation um, by a concept which is the living lab, no? uh, creating ecosystems uh, in order to, to boost uh, innovation, stakeholder engagement, co-creation, uh, circular economy in rural areas. Uh, we have been um, selecting be in, the, in the starting part of the project, uh, 13 different piloting zones where we actually wanted to implement uh, during the project these living labs. And, um, Yes, I think in the in the end we put the ecosystems uh, in the in the middle. Uh, the, the 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 actors of maybe uh, normally existing initiatives uh, put them in the middle and creating those ecosystems all around them, giving some support tools uh, in order to 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 learn to 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 bridge the gap of maybe uh, missing capacities and stakeholder engagement in introducing circular economy elements, uh, making making use of open innovation concepts. And then of course, um, translating all this, this research concepts that we have created by business model analysis, by, by benchmarking, by, by living lab uh, mapping and then data databasing 
uh, and, and giving it to uh, really uh, in, a, in a very, um, let's say, individualistic way to them in order to, to see. And of course, uh, this concept of co-creation was also something that uh, was, I think, for us specifically, um, the key. The key of, of creating our, our methodology and also the tools that help them, because we were seeing from the beginning that um, creating tools, creating tools uh, is coming from an academic standpoint. So we have a research validity in creating all this kind of different uh, the supporting tools, but we wanted to make it as useful as possible. For this, um, we involved the, the Python zones from the start being in partners in the project. The workshops that we did on the ground, all of the, all of the results, the methodology as well as the, the results were co-created. And I think that helped us in the end to filter out what was really necessary and what really helpful for, for, the, for the stakeholders and the ecosystem to, to make it flow. I think you in, the, in Robismo, um, you took a little bit different approach. You were looking um, uh, at existing business models and, and, and try to basically uh, learn from the best practices, right? Yes, exactly. And I think the European Commission uh, have used this, uh, not reinventing the wheel. Uh, and this is what we have done at Rubismo, trying to not reinvent the wheel. Uh, because there are all these very successful uh, rural businesses uh, and very diverse uh, type of businesses. So we wanted to get inspiration and learn from them. Uh, so we've been screening them, trying to analyze their, their business models and trying to extract what are the key ingredients uh, to make this yeah, great recipe uh, and, and building uh, uh, a successful business. So basically the backbone of Rubismo, and, and I think Livre had a, a very similar one, is that entrepreneurship is one engine for, um, for rural development. So we, we have been trying to focus on this, but I mean, with entrepreneurship, of course, we have entrepreneurs that needs uh, all the skills and knowledge uh, needed to, to develop. But then we have all the, the supportive actors, uh, which I think you call uh, an ecosystem and we call them a business environment. So um, quite similar similar ways, but I think I, I really uh, uh, like the way that you, you did it with the, the living labs, uh, having them in the project and learning from them and co-creating uh, together with them. Um, so I think we, we, we have similar similar approach, slightly different, but uh, maybe let, let's go to the result, the main result as well of the, of the project, because um, that's uh, also what's in, interesting and what was expected for, from the call um, as well. Um, so maybe the first point, uh, th there will be a workshop uh, later on the improved tool for entrepreneurs. Uh, so I think we won't go in length on those, but... Uh, from uh, Rubismo side, we, we have developed uh, four, five actually tools uh, for entrepreneurs, but also for um, supporting actors. Um, I yeah, think it's right. similar exactly. for you. Uh, we have a great session later on then to go in detail and make a little bit of a showcasing because we know today uh, is all about getting people interested in what we do. Of course, we will not have the time to, to really um, make you a, a whole walkthrough and a whole a functionality of this, but we want to get you interested. We want to see you, um, want to show you actually um, what are the real benefits and uses uh, of all, each of the tools and for whom are they uh, designed? Because I think also something we have uh, done a little bit uh, different in the both projects, we have thought maybe about a um, um, little bit different end users, a little bit different uh, stakeholders who, who are maybe um, uh, interested in using tools, which is great because in the end, this is very complementary. Um, we will go later into in the session with this. We have, uh, I know that Rubismo has worked a lot on the, in the, in the business analysis tool, a networking tool, uh, an e-lab learning platform, which is amazing because um, we know that a lot of people are looking into uh, getting uh, new um, ideas, new capacity in order to use uh, ICT infrastructure, specifically post-pandemic. Uh, LiveRoy has done this by creating a specialized, um, individualized uh, business model for rural areas based on our research and, and benchmarking procedures, as well as a platform which integrates also all these um, supporting tools, uh, uh, giving them a lot of help in order to, to help themselves. Because we know that what we have done is not uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, Justin said that's very well, because what we have done is we have seen a great initiative. We have seen a great effort done already in rural areas. And what we want to do is we want to help them to help themselves, to, to, to see uh, what is possible, what are alternatives. And, and for this, we're very looking forward to what Alexia said for the, 
for the um, flagship projects because that's something that we have reached a milestone. We don't have reached any end, but we are working on it to give more and more support. Regarding the, the knowledge that uh, basically got derived from the project, um, what were the main yeah, mm. knowledge output from, from your project? Yeah, um, uh, just, just as well as you have, we have done a, a ground basis analysis of business model, existing business models. Um, for us, it was a starting point to obviously uh, map out our uh, 13 piloting uh, areas all across Europe. We had one from Turkey, one from Tunisia, so very diverse. And um, what we wanted to, to have with this basically um, um, a ground floor of what exists already. And then base our, our model, our RAIN business model, how we call it, the circular rule is living lab model, based on what existing and what works and what is required already from the thing. So we used as a starting point uh, to, to really know what uh, are the zones about, what are the regions about in order then to, to go ahead and create specialized models and, and give them um, really the, the overview of, of where their business could go if they choose to. So you, you also did this. I, I know that because you have the virtual library, which is a great inspirational tool for, for people to, to compare, to see, and then to 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 get uh, uh, the inspiration mm. for 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 change, right? Yeah, I think that this is one of the the main output. But in terms of knowledge, uh, I think that the whole consortium learned a lot on business models and and those the diversity of businesses as well in rural area. Um, this concept of business environment and the supporting actors, I think, um, and and the role they play in the success of businesses. Um, also been very successful in the project. Um, maybe also looking at the role of clusters and networks, how they support uh, this business environment and how they are the engine of, of driving the process. Uh, so they, they have a very important role in, in uh, rural development, um, as actually. we have seen. And then we derived a couple of uh, quite few uh, policy recommendations that uh, will be available in the different deliverable. Um, and, and as you said, this e-learning platform, uh, which is a, a great, um, yeah, a great platform for capacity building uh, for rural areas. And, and then I think finally, uh, I guess it's the same for you, the, the network that from the consortium we build, but also the, with the other project, with the other stakeholder we, we interacted with, uh, I think this is also one of the main output of, the, of our project. Um, I think we should, let's move on to the... Yeah, yeah we have to move. Very, very difficult to about the, the, the long-term <laughs> impact um, of our project. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. It's true, the, 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 the impacts. I mean, um, it's, we have this, this, this issues of, of the... I mean, this was directly from the call. This was the expectation that the European Commission put in our project. For this, they invested in our projects uh, to see uh, how we can tackle it and how we can support them uh, in the new initiatives. And of course, um, the diversification is what you said. We, we, we had a lot of knowledge created by doing the business uh, model analysis uh, in, in Europe. We have done this with more than 250 rural businesses. Um, we have created those, those research concepts, those benchmark uh, um, things, and we have clustered them. And then, of course, um, uh, learned also from successful businesses. And then we have, to, we have broken it down from 250, went to 30 to create this kind of models. Of, of business uh, businesses existing in rural areas and then created our basic research uh, concept of the RAIN model, the research uh, model that we created for the zone. So this is something in order to help them for the diversification. Um, and of course, of, this goes directly into the resilience that, uh, that goes this because creating uh, ecosystems which inherently, I mean, living lab is a great concept, but living lab is not a solution for everything. Living lab is just inherent certain concepts like open innovation, circular economy for us, ICT infrastructure, which inherently helps inherently helps the, the, the mindset of the region, uh, cooperation and stakeholder engagement. This is something that makes a, a really an ecosystem resilient if it, if it works. Alexa was showing the graph and it goes in that direction. The more level of coherent governance we have, the more uh, uh, we have of, um, of diversifying your business and make them um, uh, circular, I think the most resilient we have. So for us, this was this. How, how did you tackle that? Well, I think it's, um, I think the future will tell us what will be the, the long-term impact. 
it, it also all depend on the, the coming uh, the coming wrap was it the rural action plan um how this will look like and this is a few uh, a slide after on this um so I, i'll keep my comment for the next the slide after actually but another thing is that because we are all here online and this is um, obviously because of the the consequences of, of the pandemic. Um, very briefly, how, how did your project reacted and adapted to this? Um, it was a great challenge. Uh, it was a great challenge. We worked mostly uh, on the ground. Uh, our whole concept was based on interaction uh, in the ecosystem itself, in the rural areas, uh, having stakeholder meetings, capacity building with the workshops on the ground, creating the tools on the ground and explaining that. So this was a big challenge for us. And it's true that for some time we had uh, difficulties to adapt because um, uh, this is something that we know from rural areas, the connectivity as well as the digitalization and the capacity of using digital tools were not as progressed um, as they should be. And uh, I like what Peter said in the beginning uh, is was, we have this kind of, of coming together of rural and, 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 and urban areas to create equal chances and the, the chances were not equal there. We overcame that, we, we, we tried to make it online, we, we made bilateral meetings mostly because also the language barrier and everything, we tried to be real bilateral, uh, which for us, it was a good concept. I know that you and Robismo uh, went uh, a little bit different way. How did you make, manage that? Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, I think, challenging at the start. Nobody knew what, what actually was happening. Um, but after a few months, we had a, a really good reaction from the, the partners and um, because we were supposed to have a lot of physical meetings and, and, and workshop and dissemination activities. Uh, we basically thought, okay, let's go online and, and let's try to do uh, as good as we can, you know, with the, the capacity we had, the budget we had and, and so on. And I think the, the, the partners delivered a very good, very good uh, results, uh, reaching out to much more people we would have done if we were, um, you know, trying to meet uh, physically with uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we could engage with much more um, advisors as well, uh, doing this way, because of course people just, uh, we, we had this uh, weekly uh, cafe talks, which were, you, you committed 30 minutes a week, uh, which can be done and you don't have to come every week as well. Um, so yeah, it was challenging, but I think we, we might have actually reached a, a better um, impact with um, by, by adapting to it. What what we saw was, was very interesting is um, we are a support tool with our projects, but how how actually great and adaptable some of the regions were were really uh, uh, amazing because they changed. Uh, we had uh, um, agritourism businesses who changed to virtual wine tasting to to adapt their business already within because we know that uh, all of our partners are looking already for solutions. We are one of the solutions, which is great, but we are not the only ones. And we can see the, the actual, the, 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 the inertia, the, the, the energy of, 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 of challenging uh, all the things that exist. And I think this is something that uh, already motivated us to push forward and forward and forward. And we're really, really happy uh, to have them on board and, and to showcase their, their results. I think it's right. I mean, the creativity comes under stress uh, and people had to react. And uh, it was very inspiring to see how businesses reacted as well, um, uh, really well. Um, so I think maybe to, to link with a bit the policy work and th then we will uh, we will also have the, the policy panel discussion. Um, Alexia mentioned the, the rural action plan and, and we see a couple of flagships that are really relevant for these two projects. Uh, the, the first one be, being the rural uh, revitalization platform, uh, because not only our two projects, other projects, we all develop tools. And uh, we feel that basically when they come at the end of the project, that's when they are the most mature and they have the most impact, but then the project ends and there's not really any workshop that take care of those tools. Uh, so we, they're just being left alone to, to rust basically. So, uh, Will be very interesting to see how this uh, flagship flagship will be implemented uh, in the future, and have yeah quite big hopes on this. Uh, then there's obviously the, the flagship on entrepreneurship and social economy in rural areas. Um, from Rubismo, we see that the need to increase the capacity building activities in in uh, rural areas uh, concerning entrepreneurship, and and then there's I think all the flagships within the, the resilient uh, rural areas. 
I think, uh, as we feel, they, they need to be there to support the uptake of ecosystem services in uh, in businesses and, and public bodies, because these ecosystem services still feel a bit um, abstract. I think in in the business world, and how how can we actually get paid to supply such ecosystem services? Uh, and a few business make it, but uh, it's, it's still quite complicated to to get paid for that. And and finally, I think we in all the all the presentation we discussed about this the importance of having connected rural areas because it, it's a it's a must. We need to be uh, connected both um, digitally but also uh, with, with transport if we want to have uh, competitive uh, businesses in rural areas. Would you like to add anything, David? Yeah, just, you're absolutely right because um, first of all. Um, we we have to we have to make sure that i mean we're doing our part to make our our tools and everything sustainable that's our obligation uh in the project and we are happy to do so do it but we would like to have this we're really looking forward to the to the, the revitalization platform because um to actually uh, put them together how to to make the people see how many op options there are um both of our, our options are all very very um uh well to 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 use uh, if you know what, what you're looking for. And for this later on in the session, we're going to talk about this, the real benefits and the real target groups, which may be, um, may be really interesting also for, for Alexia and the DG Army to see in order to how to, to structure the platform. And of course, on the other hand, we can help with concepts, we can help with uh, workshops and with the capacity building, but what we need is infrastructure. What we need really uh, is that uh, the European Commission or the European Union helps us uh, helps the rural areas in order to to push this forward, to create infrastructure, to to really realize all the concepts and all the ideas that we have put uh, in our in our reports and our tools, and to really help them to 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 take them uh, to take them uh, further as is possible right now. Perfect. I think we we are we run out of time slightly. Uh, let's have a quick look at the the the, the program uh, for the day. So. Yeah, as we say, we'll have this policy and practice uh, panel discussion uh, coming now. Then we have a break uh, before the workshop on the tools that uh, David will moderate. And then we have a final workshop on cross-regional learning, uh, learning from each other that will be led by Thomas Norvi from uh, the Swedish Agriculture University. Um, I think, yeah, I'd like to thank you, David, for, yeah, co-hosting this introduction. Thank you, uh, Jason, for, for inviting us to host us to, with us together. We're really excited for this day because we have a lot to show and we really, really hope that all I, I can see that we have more than 100 people uh, listening in on us, uh, which is great. I really hope that they get inspired by what we did, that they go to our websites, that they go to our platforms and really try out uh, what works best for them. And of course, today is a milestone for both of us but it's just a start. So whatever feedback you have, whatever you suggestions you have, whatever you need from us, what you want to want to let us know, please contact us. We are very, very open for any kind of, of collaboration with, and very open for any kind of, of, of uh, initiatives that you have and want us to know. So contact us whenever you want, whenever you can. We're here for you and it doesn't stop by just uh, ending the project. Thank you, David. And Daniel, should we move on directly to the panel discussion. Yes, indeed, yes. that's that's perfect, yeah. I think you might also have it on the next, there we go. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so I'll be more moderating the, the panel discussion and uh, I invite all panelists to maybe start their, their camera so uh, we see who they are and and then I'll give you the, the, the microphone so to have a quick introduction. Uh, but before we start, um, yeah, we would just like to mention that we had a last minute change uh, so Paolo Burini has uh, stepped up uh, from the Union of Municipalities of uh, Trasimeno, and thank you, Paolo, for uh, standing up in such a short notice. Uh, so yeah, yesterday I was trying to think how, how can I introduce this uh, this panel um, because I think we have a very interesting and diverse panel. So we we have Oana and Christine, which which are entrepreneurs, which are rural entrepreneurs. Uh, we have been studying their, their cases. Uh, they are very, very exciting, very innovative uh, cases. So very, very happy to have them. And then on the other side, we have more the, the European side. So 
uh, David Lam from the European Network uh, for Rural <coughs> Development. So, well, it's also rural development. So it's happening, you know, at the regional level, but uh, working, um, co-working together with the different uh, European region. And we have Piroska Kalai from the European Economic and Social Committee, which uh, represent the, 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 the yeah society um, at large and the, having this European aspect. And I'm actually really pleased to have Paolo as well there in, in the middle, a bit linking, working uh, with the, uh, several municipalities and trying to, to support entrepreneurs, but also having, uh, I'm guessing, some contacts higher up at the national or European level. Uh, so yeah, I'm very pleased to have this panel discussion. We will discuss how can we support uh, entrepreneurship in, in rural areas? And maybe let's have a, a round. And if we go, let's say we start with, with Oana, and then we go to David, Piroska, Paolo, and back to Christine. A very short introduction, uh, who you are, uh, what, what, who do you represent? Uh, that would okay. be perfect, Juana. Okay. Good morning to all. Thank you for the invitation. I am Paolo Burini. I am a collaborator of uh, Municipality Union of Trasimeno in uh, the center of Italy. I am uh, one of the, we are one of the partners of a uh, rural project, European project, uh, like uh, a pilot area. In Italy, in Italy, there are now in the project two uh, pilot areas, uh, Emilia Romagna, Reggio Emilia, and uh, Trasimeno, Umbria. Uh, we are uh, at, at the third year of the project. We are um, uh, looking to the many problems uh, in uh, these last years uh, connected to the President situation, but uh, overall for the changement uh, for the pandemic situation, and uh, we registered um, ch a change in on, in the management of the of the farms and of the farmers uh, management uh, about all uh, overall. Um, tourism, uh, rural tourism, in the farmhouses uh, and uh, rural companies, uh, reception, uh, rece reception uh, activity, accommodation services. And uh, we, we, we noted that in these uh, last two years, uh, there, uh, we, we, uh, we registered uh, um, a very interesting uh, increasing of the uh, youth farmer worker. And we are uh, sure uh, that we oh, must uh, uh, help these youth people to uh, enter in the rural uh, world uh, because there are the very um, important uh, needs connected to uh, your ob objects, uh, objectives uh, you, you saw you, you, you show, uh, before um, about uh, in social inclusion, co-creation, uh, open innovation. And we are, uh, we try to, uh, to give uh, to the entrepreneurs uh, a model of little uh, organization of uh, uh, rural markets connected mm. to other activities. Mm. I, I think, Paolo, I have to stop you here because it feels like you already answered my questions that I will ask uh, uh, soon. So um, I'll ask the other panelists to keep the introduction um, briefly. This is just to set who, who is who. Uh, but thank you so much, Paolo, for int the introduction. I don't know if you could start your camera. Um, that, that would be also uh, good mm. to, to see. Okay. Um, should we move back to you, Uana? Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Uana Iliescu. We are from uh, Romania, Northeast uh, region. And uh, we are representing uh, Taina Vie. Uh, big, we have a beekeeping uh, activity started uh, from 2010. Uh, and also, uh, we diversified our activity with uh, European projects, uh, starting a new uh, 
business uh, in uh, uh, tourism, uh, touristic guided tours with uh, um, electric uh, bikes, cube. And uh, also we have um, rural um, agricultural tourism activity with glamping, camping and a cafe established here in Romania. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And you also win a couple of awards, at least one from Rubismo, the Rubismo um, Business Award. Oh. Thank you very much uh, for giving uh, giving us this opportunity. We are uh, in 2019. Uh, we uh, won uh, this project from Rubismo with a presentation movie um, about uh, our activity. So uh, it was uh, a very nice uh, a very nice movie about uh, our uh, innovative project. Uh, uh, diversifying acti our activity from beekeeping uh, to um, uh, touristic activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wana. We didn't give you anything. You you deserved it. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, should we move to you, Christine? And Blue Lobster. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm one of the co-founders of Blue Lobster. And basically, we're creating a platform for sustainable fishermen to be able to sell on to their customers. Um, and yeah, basically cutting out this long chain of middlemen that's in the supply chain, giving the autonomy back to the fishermen to be able to make their own sales. And um, yeah, basically just making this connection. And obviously we're, we're also trying to figure out what we can do for the rural fishermen. Um, and I think they're the ones that need us the most and they need this tool the most. And it's definitely been, a big part of our mission to create the connection, facilitate the logistics, um, and also enable the entrepreneurial fishermen to be able to, uh, to do their own sales, but also their own logistics. Um, and we've seen quite a few of the, the fishermen in areas that aren't so well connected popping up. Um, and yeah, that's that's part of part of it. But basically our, our vision is to empower fishermen anywhere to be able to sell their fish without being basically ostracized by the current system. Yeah, it, it is a very uh, elegant solution you, you offer, I think. And you, you also had some kind of award or nomination to best entrepreneur, young entrepreneur, something like this. Could you tell us a bit more? Um, about yeah, this? I, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, no, we, that was, uh, uh, also a, a great opportunity and you no, know, we, we really appreciate getting highlighted also just getting on the radar um, so that people know about the issue. They know that they know how to, to ask their, um, yeah, they know how to ask the right questions about the fish. Uh, and yes. Good to have you here, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then let's go to you, Piroska. Can I, you tell us a bit more? Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Um, first of all, let me congratulate you for this magnific magnificent uh, project, what you are doing, what you have achieved, I think, all contribute to make rural areas flourish. I'm pleased to be invited uh, representing the, the European Economic and Social Committee today and uh, be a part of such an important event. Thank you very much for that. Uh, amongst uh, others, I'm jurist representing trade unions uh, dealing with labor law specifically with the, the rights of uh, agricultural workers. And in the ESC, amongst others, I'm a member of the NET, uh, so Agriculture, Rural Development and um, Environmental Section. My president at the beginning of uh, this uh, event, uh, Peter Schmidt, had, has already introduced our uh, committee. Uh, and then uh, I will... Uh, I will uh, speak about uh, our uh, ongoing activities uh, uh, in the panel. In the panel, thank you very much. Thank you, Piroska. Thank you. And let's finish with David. Ah, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm David Lamb. I'm from the contact point of the European Network for Rural Development. I'll make the distinction, and that little Alexia mentioned some of our activity earlier in her um, presentation. But yes, we bring together the national rural networks from across the EU, all 27 member states. And we also bring together, try to bring together 
um, European level stakeholders representing agriculture and environment, obviously rural development um, as well to improve the quality of the delivery of rural development stakeholders, which all sounds very grand, but um, in tangible terms, that means we work on a number of initiatives. Um, so uh, just in our last interaction was Rural Vision Week, where we were discussing how we implement better the uh, those activities that uh, complement uh, that complement and contribute to the long-term vision for rural areas. Alexia mentioned it, and we'll be moving on with that, um, looking at strands such as rural revitalization and rural proofing in the work we do going forward. A little more tangibly, we also collect together lots of inspiring um, projects, many of them entrepreneurial, and we also have an award program each year across the EU, the Rural Inspiration Awards, where we take together uh, projects funded under the rural development programs and try and nominate the best across a few categories. But I can talk more of that a little bit later. That, that'll do as a brief introduction. Thank you. Thank you, David. Very good uh, to know about this. So, uh, yeah, we basically, I, I have like three questions uh, to, to ask you. And if you, if in the audience, if you, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A. Um, part of the of the zoom webinar and, and then we'll see at the end if we if we have time to to answer a couple of them uh, so just to set the the, the tone why, why why do we need more entrepreneurs in rural areas uh, who would like to take that i'll just stop the sharing the screen so then maybe the cameras will be a little better piroska Sorry, uh, and David after. No problem at all. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor. Well, um, we all know that uh, rural areas play a critical role in economic and social cohesion in the regions, resilience, and in the contribution of countless services from various local ecosystems, including food production. So they should be made more attractive for people and businesses to improve the quality of life and well-being of uh, all EU citizens, uh, allowing them to choose uh, where they want to live and work. So uh, due to the pandemic in several countries, many job opportunities occurred. Uh, indeed, young people returned to work in rural areas thanks to new technologies, or let's think about the advantages of uh, digitalization or uh, about new technologies. It's a reverse process if you, if you want. Uh, as uh, as um, Peter Schmidt uh, has already stressed at the beginning, uh, the future is also written in the countryside and in the villages. And uh, we truly uh, convinced that development of small settlements is, is the responsibility of, uh, of uh, everyone. We at CSC um, call on uh, policymakers to develop and implement um, comprehensive and holistic EU strategy for balanced, cohesive and uh, equitable and sustainable rural and urban development in order to level the, the playing fields between uh, rural communities and uh, the, the urban environment. How uh, this can be achieved by the, the development of local rural and urban partnerships to create economic, um, social and environmental opportunities and and, and foster a better understanding of uh, interdependencies between rural and urban communities. Well, uh, such partnerships uh, should establish a structural and vital link between rural and urban areas. We are also very concerned about rural development and, uh, and we are convinced, as uh, Peter Schmidt said in his opening, uh, opening speech, sorry, that uh, the future of Europe uh, will depend on how we deal with uh, rural areas. Um, it's uh, very difficult to keep this European rural sector alive, as we know. So we need a new approach, a new paradigm that, uh, that goes beyond these specific policies uh, that we have. Uh, we have seen so far that uh, the cap is not enough to face all these problems. So we need new structural and regional policies and as, as well based on the already well-functioning system. So we want to emphasize a different scenario, a different opening to the rural area and a different uh, relationship between them. So we, we, we recognize 
as well how the pandemic has accelerated different activities related to the employment, new jobs with remote wor working, new forms of working. So we need a new approach to have an improved uh, quality of life in uh, rural areas. This includes uh, boosting traditional industries, but also creating new economic activities through innovative business opportunities in rural areas. Then um, uh, strengthening the multifunctional aspects of agriculture, promoting non-agricultural activities and establishing businesses in uh, the clean energy services and the industry sector in rural areas can, can create many job opportunities as well. Um, promoting entrepreneurship, ensuring fair competition rules for SMEs and paying attention to the needs of the younger generation or economic growth and job creation are important in rural areas, but we all know that these must be complemented by sufficient supply of good quality services, housing, energy, let's say leisure, education and training, lifelong learning and healthcare system to ensure that rural areas are not only sustainable, but also attractive places mm -hmm. to live. Um, there is, yes. There's many, and, uh, many so reasons briefly, and, uh, you mentioned only. Uh, Lots of them. David, do you, do you have anything to add? Sorry. Yeah, I can. Okay. I, no, that's fine. I can, I can add a little bit. I'm quite happy to add a little bit. I think Piroska gave a really good overview of what's needed. Perhaps uh, I would just say that, um, yes, we absolutely do need rural entrepreneurs. We need their drive. We need their energy. Um, and we need their, their ability to help us build rural communities. But I think in all of that, we have to... I think I'm reflecting on what Broska said. We have to let entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs. We shouldn't ask them to be the drivers of our community, the drivers of our rural areas. We have to give them uh, into the. We have to recognize that interdependence. We have to give them the resources and the the basis and sometimes the infrastructure to enable them to thrive. We shouldn't be shy. Broska was mentioning that urban rural relationship we shouldn't be shy in saying we want urban entrepreneurs to come to rural areas to to help to drive them forward but i think we always have to recognize and i liked how it was put and i know i recognize you had two different terms for it um the idea of the business environment or the ecosystem they can contribute to that but we also must recognize that that should contribute to them i worked a lot with entrepreneurs they don't want to waste their time applying for funding and accessing systems and so on. We need to create a system in which that access, that resource, that connection is there. And when, that, when I say that, I mean that, that in the digital and physical sense, including human connection. Very good point, uh, David. Uh, maybe going to the entrepreneurs, Uwana and Christine, why rural areas need you? Um, may I? You can go first. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, actually, you had a very good point uh, on connecting uh, this part in real life. I mean, research with entrepreneurs is very important, especially in our businesses. We are supporting uh, zero net carbon initiatives. It is one of our main goals. So uh, that's why it's very important uh, in real life uh, and uh, uh, to support these innovative projects, uh, to create uh, actually a circular uh, living recreational lab, lab if I can say. Uh, because uh, here at Taina VM, we have uh, beehives, for example, we have uh, 25 uh, e-bikes, QB bikes, we also have a cafe, as you can see in uh, my background, which is uh, like a very innovative space because uh, we have uh, our local entrepreneurs, uh, they are displaying their products there. So it's our uh, way to say, uh, to educate people um, uh, consuming healthy products, uh, uh, encouraging uh, them uh, to, uh, to have more outdoor recreational activities and uh, also to connect uh, research and uh, the, you know, people uh, working uh, in universities and, uh, I mean, around our rural area 
uh, to come here and to have workshops uh, in real life. I mean, not only virtual. Uh, we, we are really encouraging this kind of activities. Uh, for example, this summer we have uh, 50 students studying in a summer uh, camp here in Iași, in Romania, and uh, they visited us from all, uh, they were uh, from all, uh, all over the world. So they uh, taste our uh, uh, local products, they tried our e-bikes, uh, some of them uh, visited our glamping, so it was uh, a very nice meeting and uh, we also had uh, different uh, discussions about how can we develop this zero net uh, carbon uh, footprint, because it's very important on short, uh, middle term and long term. Thank you. Thank you, Juana. So is, if I can summarize, basically, we need entrepreneurs because they are also they, are, they they form this ecosystem they, they are a meeting point for many different stakeholders and uh, i think it's yeah it's, it's very interesting the way you you put it um thank you Juana. christine you. why why do we need blue lobster in rural areas or similar um, yeah. solutions yeah I, th I think there's there's something about people who are coming from like an entrepreneurial mindset who are like looking at the world and looking at what inefficiencies there are and where we can make connections and where we can improve things that aren't in a good state as there are and then there are also the people who are popping up all over the place and coming up with their own solutions um, often in rural areas um, I think we've seen it in so many so many times with different fishermen like there's an island in Denmark where um, this fisherman he didn't feel connected enough from with the um, like the auction system and the current sales channel. So he started like a Facebook group and he started getting all of his own followers and he started writing out like, okay, I'll be, I'll be with this fish at this point from 11 to 11.30. And then two hours later, I will be at this other point at this grocery store with my truck and you can come and get fish. And I think it's somehow bringing together the people who have the skills and the maybe like the technical background to make those connections and giving the tools to these people who are clearly entrepreneurial and trying to improve their own their own state and i think with rural areas it really has a lot to do with yeah like like what has been said before about the connectivity and creating the logistical setup to be able to actually move something physical like there's so much value coming from farms and fishing in rural areas to be able to actually connect it with people who want those things, whether they're also in the rural areas, like they could be at the next farm over and there's just not that, there's not a smooth communication tool to be able to say, okay, I'll, I'll come to your farm and pick this up. Um, so yeah, I think it's somehow a mix of these things popping out of up out of necessity and then bringing together the people who have the skills to uh, really implement a, uh, sustainable uh, efficient solution yeah, very, yeah so helping rural areas to be more efficient businesses to be more competitive uh very interesting pa paolo uh i don't know if you could turn on your, your camera as well so i can see you do you have any inputs on wh I, why I, do we need uh, entrepreneurs in rural sorry areas? i i don't see my image my picture i don't see yeah could you uh, switch on your video screen I, I hear you, but I don't see my, my... Yes, because you have to turn on your video. But we hear you very well, Paolo. So maybe... Uh, via video, okay. okay. Maybe someone from the, the okay. yeah, technical yes. can help you as well. May, uh, may I speak about yes, the, please, Paolo. My, my, my entrepreneur's uh, needs? Uh, yes. um, in our area, I, I said uh, before, there are many farmhouses and um, uh, accommodation service because these uh, companies, these farms are around uh, Trasimeno Lake. And for uh, uh, an old situation and a new situation connected to pandemic uh, crisis, crisis uh, we need to support the entrepreneurs uh, uh, for the 
a new management of, uh, of, of the farm. Uh, we, we saw that many of them change their uh, habitudes and then uses to, to management the farm. Um, now the law, the regional law, uh, allows that um, they could um, uh, introduce many possibilities uh, like uh, ac um, uh, accommodation, restaurant, uh, um, tasting, uh, classes, uh, and this is the, 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 the main, uh, the, the most important action to go on in, in the future for them. Uh, together to this situation, we, uh, we note that um, our uh, increasing many little local markets. And we have uh, an example in one of our municipality, Paciano, uh, in this uh, community, in this, uh, in this town, not only farmers, but uh, farmhouse, farmhouses uh, owners, uh, uh, handcrafts, uh, artisans, um, and other uh, companies are together to build a physical and digital uh, platform to improve and to uh, develop this uh, local economy, based uh, on co-creation, on open innovation, and overall in, uh, on uh, uh, social inclusion. Because in our reg region, there are uh, many, many migrants. They are working for a new, a new work uh, overall in uh, rural uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. So maybe just to summarize, why do we need rural uh, entrepreneurs in, in rural areas or entrepreneurs in rural areas? So we need them to have attractive, diverse, resilient, competitive, efficient rural areas with a, a social uh, link as well. So um, might be so, so, so some few more, but I think these keywords also are, are mirrored in the different policy um, being implemented at the moment. So. Uh, yeah, very interesting uh, inputs. Uh, if we go a bit more concretely, uh, and I'll ask you first, Christine, from the entrepreneur perspective, did you feel that, you know, in, during your journey, your entrepreneurial journey, the development of the solution, that you've got very good support from, you know, a regional actor, uh, from what we call the business environment, from external partners that really well, I'm not sure if we could say without them, you won't be there today, but that really helped you to, to, to get your product uh, on the market. Yeah, I, I think the, yeah, the kind of the path of the least resistance for us was um, to start off in an urban area, actually. Um, so, yeah, we started off working just out of Copenhagen and um, with the harbors within a 40 minute driving radius of here. Um, but I think we could see right away that we were helping the the urban fishermen so much less than we would than we we're uh, helping the rural ones um, and the one and the harbors that just aren't necessarily as connected um, by by the current logistical setup by the auctions basically the auctions drive from harbor to harbor to harbor and they pick up um, they pick up the fish and they bring it to these centralized auctions. On, in a different island of Denmark, um, in, in Jutland. And we could see that the fishermen that were closer to the cities were um, definitely getting paid more, but the fish was also getting picked up way, way more frequently. So by the time it hit the auction, they were getting paid much better because it was just a fresher fish. And the more disconnected harbors, they were sometimes, the auctions were coming once a week, sometimes every other week. And then the fish just degrades, degrades, and they, those fishermen were actually having to pay the auction to come and pick up their fish. So they were sometimes losing money. So they would go out and they would end up losing money. Um, so we definitely saw that they had the, there was the most room to help those fishermen. Um, and in terms of people helping us, I think we, we started to collaborate with some local municipalities who had a vested interest in um, yeah, basically boosting the economy of, of their region. Um, and I think 
that this is probably where we saw or where we see the like the biggest potential um, is where the local government sees the potential of bringing someone in like us and then we start to work together and come up with solutions and figure out like what can the logistics look like how can we create like um, a bigger sales channel where we can actually start to improve the the livelihoods of these more disconnected communities of fishermen um so i don't know if that's such a direct help i i think it wasn't so much about money it was more about getting the interest of the the political parties aligned with what we were doing and kind of working together um and that's been that's been the the best avenue for us i think that's a very good point that we often mistake support with money it's not only about money it's yeah i think just there the networking getting access to the the right people is is uh, is definitely some support wana um what about tainavi um in for tainavi and joy right uh, yes uh, we are trying uh, to uh, create here a very strong community with our uh, local partners and uh, like we said in the presentation movie about uh, Joyride and Taina VM, a good neighborhood is strategic, is vital. And I, when I'm saying neighborhood, I'm uh, saying uh, locals, people, uh, uh, you know, ensuring uh, some products, for example, uh, offering for uh, touristic activities for tasting, uh, uh, sessions and something like this. Also, um, we attract. We are trying to attract uh, more um, local entrepreneurs uh, to sell their product uh, in our cafe place. You mm -hmm. know, uh, um, like uh, cold pressed oil. Um, uh, I don't know uh, our uh, honey producers, uh, like uh, like this local entrepreneurs. Uh, also, we are trying to develop with um, the city hall, with, uh, for example, with um, Switzerland Embassy, with uh, Netherlands Embassy, which strongly supports um, uh, this e-bike activity, and uh, also because we are uh, located in um, in a metropolitan zone nearby, uh, the so rural and urban are uh, really meet each other here in our place. Uh, so, yes, I think we are a good example of, um, um, of a um, nice try to create a, a good neighborhood here with uh, local entrepreneurs and also with, uh, with uh, people uh, and universities and also another institution around, around us. Thank you, Anna. Um, and uh, Chrissy, you mentioned that uh, municipalities helped you. Uh, maybe we should go to Paolo, which is a, a member of Union of Municipalities. Could you tell us a bit, how, how do you support entrepreneurs um, in, in, your, in your municipalities? Your microphone is on mute. Uh, okay, <clears throat> our support to entrepreneurs in our area is overall um, connected to uh, service uh, um, assistance, dissemination services and uh, uh, um, innovation transferred because uh, in this period for the, the cases of the situation that I, I spoke uh, before, uh, this new changement, new uh, changement need, uh, but, uh, must be supported by uh, new instruments, uh, digital, uh, digitalization instrument, digi digital instruments, like a digital platform, uh, uh, the opportunity of give uh, tools to entrepreneurs to um, evaluate, to estimate the changement connected to the uh, introduction of a, a circular model of economy, uh, because uh, the traditional uh, um, system um, uh, of economy uh, is different now. If we want to introduce this new model, 
we uh, must uh, uh, give to the entrepreneurs tools to uh, estimate this uh, exchangement, ante-situation and post-situation. What is the, the difference in terms of uh, gross margin and uh, in, um, improvement of the, of the farm, of the management, of the environment and other mm -hmm. aspects? Okay. Very interesting way to support entrepreneurs. Um, Thank you to hear from them as well. But thank you, know, Paolo. I, I hope to be clear. <laughs> it's very, very good. Uh, David, how do you work at the... Yeah, well, we're, uh, I suppose, I have worked directly with entrepreneurs in the past. We don't work directly with them, but what we try to do is, uns well, uh, first, we have, I mentioned the Rural Inspiration Award. We actually collect across the EU lots and lots of good practices in how rural development money is spent. We have nearly 700 and over 150 of them have the tag entrepreneurship in them. So we have lots of examples that we share, um, not just on the website, on the UNID website where you can access them, but we share them in our work. Some of them are gathered from our work. So we've worked on themes like smart villages on the long-term vision. We'll work now on themes such as rural resilience. So we bring together expertise across Europe, but also what we are very keen on is sharing the lessons between the rural networks nationally. If there are great examples, it's come as no surprise that I think networking and cooperation are vital in exchanging what we do and what we do well. So, for example, the Swedish Rural Network has excellent webinars on entrepreneurship and podcasts that they'll do. And we'll try and take some of those, that's one example, we'll try and take those examples and transfer them to say, have you seen what's happening in Sweden or Finland or Romania or Italy and try and take those examples and say, you can learn from them. It's a lot easier for entrepreneurs to look at an example that's far distant and therefore it doesn't have to be competitive and say, yeah, that's, that's something that we can adopt and do. Transferring that into something practical is, uh, is different as well. And that we think that that's um, about getting the right support, as I said earlier. And the bit that I haven't mentioned though there is um, we like to try and build in those people that are the really between what we do and the business themselves. So advisors and um, those providing services to businesses. It's very important that they've got the skills to do the kind of processes that entrepreneurs might not want to do. One of the things I've always said is an entrepreneur will get on with it and create a business. They won't wait for the funding or the administration to catch up with them. So you need to make sure that um, there are people there and advisors can provide a vital role in that to help them to enable to say, oh, yes, you can access this and here's how you do it. And maybe we'll even do the form for filling for you, but to, to provide that um, smooth process. And that's something that we certainly want to see going forward. And bearing in mind that I'm talking about one single fund, but rural proofing means thinking about all the different funding options and how we can bring them together and, and have that community type uh, focus. That's some examples of, of what we do and how we look to progress. I think uh, it's very true and especially the, the funding ecosystem could, could feel sometimes uh, as a jungle and maybe I don't know if later Christine and Juana you want to, to share your experience on this uh, th that could be good but yeah. Even from my side, sometimes trying to understand what could help, what could support entrepreneurs, it takes yeah, days to understand what's the requirement and so on. But maybe to, to, to finish the round with, with you, Piroska, uh, and then maybe after Christine and Juana, if you want to answer to that. Uh, so, yeah, how do you support entrepreneurs or how do you see that we should support yeah. entrepreneurs? Thank you. Uh, so, so we as ESC, uh, so we are called the, the, the house of uh, civil society. Okay, so we, we connect civil society actors with the EU institutions and policy policymakers. So we we always uh, have worked for so for many years with representatives of civil society on the on the issue of uh, rural development and developed several opinions proposing a holistic EU strategy for for a sustainable development of uh, rural and vulnerable areas. Uh, so during the, the public hearing, which uh, was held on, on uh, 18th June, if I remember correctly, in the context of our opinion on uh, sustainable rural urban development, 
uh, we connected civil society actors such as uh, aircraft repair or e-learn from, from the rural world, but also networks of uh, cities such as the Euro cities and the Euro towns and academics to present best practices and share ideas on how to co-develop a, a holistic forward looking approach for sustainable rural and urban development in the EU. And um, we also worked very closely with, uh, with the European Commission, both DG Agri and the DG Regio on, on, uh, on our opinion, uh, in which we, we, we stressed the need to, to promote entrepreneurship and to ensure fair competition rules for SMEs while uh, paying attention to the, to the needs of uh, younger generation as well. So uh, we just try to to, to involve as much uh, as we can, so civil society in, uh, in our work, uh, with, with uh, consultations, with discussions, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, platforms and forums uh, uh, to, 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 to make heard uh, our voice. So that's uh, briefly what we do for entrepreneurs. Yeah. In the I think it's very good to hear that uh, there's many ways, as we said, to, to support. So dissemination, uh, innovation, transfer, you, you mentioned, uh, yeah, support to implement a different type of business models, for example, circular economy. Um, some, yeah, sharing good best practices, good practices uh, don't have to be best all the time uh, with awards, um, like inspiration. We, we have something similar in, in Rubismo with the, the virtual uh, virtual library, um, exchanging, networking um, between entrepreneurs or with other supporting actors, um, advice on funding, as, as well was mentioned. And, and then also what was interesting to hear from you, Christine, and, and one was that, well, it, it can be literally anybody. Uh, and I really like your comment, one on, yeah, my neighbors are very important for me to, to develop my, my business. Uh, the municipalities um, that also other entrepreneurs are, are important to to collaborate with so so i think that that's very we need to get away from this support is uh, how much money can i get um actually uh, so that, that was very inspiring uh, i don't know if one and christine you had a, a comment on what david said the the ease to get access to to funding how was it for you? Did you get any funding or was it? Yeah. Uh, we get uh, good funding from European Union because we have, uh, we had uh, this beekeeping activity. So it was an agricultural uh, activity. So uh, we earned uh, a lot of points when we applied on a uh, European project because it was a diversification diversification from uh, agricultural activity to non-agricultural activity so actually we we've earned uh, like uh, 95 90 points from 100 points so it, we we had a highly score mm -hmm. and uh, so we uh, we earned two european projects one we, it was with um, this uh, e-bike uh, e-bikes and the other one was with um, um, photo equipment and the drone equipment, mm -hmm. which is also helping us a lot in uh, developing our businesses and also our uh, our, uh, our community uh, area because uh, we are we, all the time we are promoting our area, our country. And also, why not European Union activities? Because uh, we uh, we are providing a very good images and also a highly uh, uh, quality products. So yes, uh, so, European in Union helped us a lot. Yeah. So you, you know how to nav navigate, uh, how to in this jungle. Uh, very good to hear. Actually, it is a jungle. It is a jungle because, uh, you know, in order to uh, encourage this uh, zero net uh, carbon uh, initiatives, we also need to encourage our suppliers, uh, our value chain, you know, to support uh, and uh, to apply all these uh, objectives. Mm. It's not only about us. 
-hmm. And uh, all the time I'm explaining uh, to our community and uh, to our people, uh, uh, just, it's very simple. Uh, think uh, global and act local. It's mm -hmm. all about this. And uh, if it's about also about good neighborhood, it's on or horizontal and on vertical. Uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's a good strategy, but uh, yeah. there is no time, you know? <laughs> very uh, inspiring uh, comments there, Wana. Christine, Thank do you, you have something on the access to funding or? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that it is a bit of a jungle to figure out all of the different funding opportunities and how to how to apply. I think we we've been quite successful in the Danish context, um, and I think when we're looking at getting EU funding, we're we've, we're really leaning into uh, collaborating with other players who where we can each kind of bring something different to the project. So usually we're bringing the the tech aspect and. Then we're working with um, the fishing union uh, for, for sustainable fishing and um, yeah, some, some of these other organizations, uh, so, sometimes universities where we can all apply together. So we have a couple of applications um, out to get some funding from the EU. Um, so we will see how that goes. But I think that this is the way forward to find synergies where everybody has their own um, expertise and you kind of get together and apply together as, as one cohesive group. Um, yeah, but it is a jungle and That's great. it would be nice if it was uh, easier to figure out what you apply, what you actually qualify for. And um, yeah. Hmm. Maybe if you want to, to get more EU uh, projects, you should team up with uh, Wana. Uh, she will, yeah. <laughs> she could help you out. Um, all right. I see that the time is up. Do we have a uh, time for, to, to, Maybe have one more word from each panelist, uh, Daniel. Yes, we have the time. No worries. Okay, perfect. So maybe I, I will ask you to, if you have to choose one, uh, one measure to implement to support entrepreneurs, uh, and literally this has to be one sentence. Um, what would that be uh, for you? What would be the most efficient way to, to, to get more entrepreneurs in rural areas? Um, so. Whoever is ready first, um, hands up and one up, yes? Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, my advice is uh, to be yourself in business uh, and also as a person, because uh, this is the way to define uh, your activities and be innovative also. Be innovative. Yes, it's not about, uh, it's not all about the you found, it's about ourselves. How can we act uh, together in our uh, uh, area, but also to think global? This is my main point, to be innovative and uh, to be creative also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wana. Next, David, David. Yeah, I think um, what we need is a better flow. I think that what you've said about the whole working together, we need a better flow for rural entrepreneurs to know where they can access support, advice, other people in their communities. Uh, uh, we can have a better flow of information and support and know who to lean on. Um, networks are a really good place for leaning on and starting on. And we, I think that's something that we'll take into our work of making sure that if you phone up the network or if you get in contact with the network, they can tell you here's where to start um, so that we can get up, start faster and more fluid. Great. Thank you, David. Christine, was that your hand up? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it probably being really honest about what you're good at and what you're not good at and finding the complementary skills. Um, and yeah, I, I totally agree about thinking on a, on a global scale as well um, and finding solutions that can work in many different contexts because that's the only way we can have a, a really big impact. Great, thanks. Paulo. Uh, I think that the European funds are very, very important for the development of our territory and, uh, and the action connected. But um, we, we must uh, go on uh, with uh, our actions uh, in, in near the entrepreneurs 
uh, with the support to to, uh, to build uh, new value economic chains, uh, a new model of certification, and uh, this is uh, uh, is is far for the for the original uh, European funds. But we we uh, we know that now we must support them in uh, this uh, construction, this building of uh, the new model about overall uh, certification. If, if we, 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 uh, we think to <coughs> pandemic uh, crisis, we now, uh, we must support them in, in this new uh, model with uh, uh, PNRR or PSR funds mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with, uh, with the help of association professional organization. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, and yeah, to finish, Piroska, you have the final okay, So word. it's really briefly, okay? It, it should be a general uh, comment. So uh, entrepreneurs are, are the sine qua non of uh, territorial development and uh, their, uh, their status uh, is the responsibility of all uh, decision makers. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we can end on this. Uh, great summary from uh, Piroska. Uh, I would like to thank all the, the panelists uh, for your very interesting insights, uh, your time as well. And uh, yeah, hope to meet all of you at some point, maybe in, in real life soon. Um, yeah, thanks again, everybody. And uh, back to you, Daniel. So what we will do now is move into a session about the tools um, developed in the projects. Uh, of Libero and Rubismo. Um, to lead that session will be David Heiser, who you heard from a bit earlier, the coordinator of Libero. So if uh, David is there, I would pass over to him. Thank you. Thank you Perfect. very much, uh, Daniel. Indeed. Yes. Uh, hello and welcome, everybody, uh, again. I'm very, very happy and proud to, to present the, uh, the, the session, the first workshop uh, about the results and specifically the, uh, the developed tools of our uh, two projects. Um, I'm very happy to have a lot of people here with me today who actually uh, were responsible for developing those tools, for designing those tools, for testing those tools. And uh, I would like to present them to you so you know uh, who we are uh, talking with today. Uh, we have Klaus Wagner who is the, uh, the head of the Department of Mountain Re Area Research and Regional Development at the Federal Institute of Agricultural Economics Rural Mountain Research in Austria. Hello, Klaus. We have uh, Hello. Alexander Shimona, who is a senior project manager at the Institute of Entrepreneurial Development uh, in Greece. She was the one responsible in life for, um, for uh, development of the regional uh, circular living lab tool, the RAIN platform itself. We have with us Gerhard Schiefer, from the University of Bonn and the director of the software company of ProQuantis. He was the one responsible in the, uh, in the Rovismo project. Uh, he developed the business transformation tool as well as a network a database tool. Welcome uh, to this panel. We have with us uh, Thomas Norby, who is uh, the manager for the area of rural development at the Department of Urban and Rural Development at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. He was the one responsible uh, to uh, develop the e-learning platform at Rubismo. And we have Philip Grundmann with us, who is the head of research uh, of the research group of transformation of socio-technical systems and institutional change at the Leipzig Institute for Agricultural Engineering. And as well, he is from the Humboldt University in Berlin, from Germany. Uh, he was the one responsible in Rubismo for developing the business environment. So welcome. Uh, to this panel. Thank you very much for your collaboration and your, um, your availability to talk with us. Um, this is a very, very important section. If you remember this morning, we in the session that Justin uh, and, and I was inaugurating, we talked a little about the call and the expectation of the European Commission towards our projects and the two big parts, the two big expected impacts were the improved tools for entrepreneurship in rural areas and the improved knowledge in business uh, models. Those were expected results. And uh, of course, uh, both of the projects um, interpreted this, uh, this results a little bit differently, but uh, we came to, to great results. Now we have worked for three and a half years and uh, basically all the tools, all the platforms, all the support uh, is 
is ready. We have tested it. We have uh, created it with them together. And today, today we're going to showcase them to you. We're going to make uh, a first round of, uh, of, of everybody uh, presenting the tools in a very short way. Um, please, of course, know that we have a very limited time frame. And um, although the tools are very interesting, very complex, our panelists will uh, try to give you a, a very good insight of what it is. And as I said before, if you're interested, well, we, are, we, we hope that you have take the time later on and go to our platforms, to our websites and investigate them uh, further. Um, we gave more or less a five minutes to each of our, of our panelists uh, to, to teaser them. We are very open to questions from the audience and uh, of course, uh, any kind of, of suggestions that you might have. Um, we will start with, with Klaus. Klaus, uh, you developed in the LiveRo project the, uh, the RAIN business model. Uh, right now, in this session, we're looking for, for really tangible uh, feedback. Uh, what is exactly behind the, the, the business model? Um, who is it for? What are the benefits for using it? And maybe who should really use that to, to get the benefit? Klaus, please. Uh, thank you, David. Hello to everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, our task was uh, to develop the new concept uh, for business model, which uh, should meet uh, very special requirements. We called it uh, the RAIN concept, which means a uh, regional circular living lab. And the objective was uh, it should be a structured approach uh, for developing a project or an activity or an, a business in rural regions. So it uh, was not only made in economic terms, but also it should uh, be uh, good for also environmental or social activities uh, or, or various services. The target group is everyone who wants to start or improve also a, a business or an activity in rural regions. So if you have a problem or an opportunity or a challenge in a region, uh, uh, we have heard in the morning that the, it is, the situation is very complex and there are a lot of ambitions and there are very high requirements. And therefore we did a lot of work and we had empirical work and theoretical work in the Livro project. And we collected all uh, notions, all recent uh, approaches, all promising concepts and we try to integrate all these uh, new findings and, and the topics of the new programs and, and, and strategies also from the European Union and on, on various levels. And uh, we put them together and you see that this is, is very complex. So we try to structure these, all these notions and we came to a solution uh, with three layers. The first layer is uh, about the RAIN core elements in the center, you have a vision and business idea, for example, and you build around all the topics you need for a good business model. But then in the lifetime of the Livre project, we developed and we, we summarized all the principles and we structured uh, seven RAIN principles, which are uh, the different kinds of sustainability, like uh, social, ecological, economic sustainability, but then also for, of course, circular economy, stakeholder involvement, openness was a big topic and open innovation and of course, a very modern ICT support. But this is not enough, we thought. And therefore we have a third layer, which is the RAIN real life, uh, which, is a, uh, which limits or enables business models. It's about uh, the environment of a project and it includes, uh, for example, the economic context, the legal institutional and political framework, also the technical, social infrastructure, and so on. Also environment and climate plays a big role. So, and uh, how to implement it? We see that it is a, a little complex, but we developed a lot of worksheets and procedures with uh, support of the RAIN toolbox and the RAIN platform, for example. And uh, in the end, when you follow these procedures, you should have a RAIN business plan. And the pilot regions applied these procedures and all this and, and used the worksheets. Of course, not always complete and in the full version, but the time in the uh, life livery project was limited and also the COVID situation doesn't make it easier, but uh, the pilot regions worked with our results. 
So this is for the first impression of this RAIN concept. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus. I think later on, uh, when we have uh, done a round, uh, we have some very specific <laughs> questions about how easy it was to, uh, to transmit a complex model such as this uh, to our basic target group, which, uh, which uh, I think listens to us today and, and would like to know what kind of challenges we had of, of transporting and trans translating this kind of business ideas. Thank you very much. Alexandra, talk to us now about, because you uh, were the one in Life Roar who actually took those uh, the ideas, those concepts and uh, put them together through the workshops and through stakeholder engagement uh, inside of, of a uni unified uh, platform, an entrepreneurial platform. So tell us about uh, the platform of, of, of Life. Thank you very much. Uh, so starting with a few words about the RAIN platform, it's actually a regional circular living club platform and a business-oriented practical tool proposed and based on the Liver project. Uh, this tool is, in, is targeting uh, entrepreneurs, potential entrepreneurs and policy makers, as well as an innovation ecosystem community to support the implementation of circular economy solutions for the supply uh, value chains. Uh, by using this tool, you can find uh, useful resources for evaluating business models and obtain advice and co-design successful uh, business model. Also, this platform uh, is a contact point for entrepreneurs and stakeholders involved in the circular economy, adapted to the rural uh, context and living lab concept. Uh, and this contributes a lot to, uh, to rural and regional development. In order to give you a brief uh, and comprehensive uh, insight in the platform, I will show you a video that uh, we had prepared uh, which actually shows how to navigate on the platform as well as uh, how the platform looks like. So I will share this video with you right now. Yeah, Hello. the sound is off, I think, for the video. I don't know oh. if it's supposed to be sound. Okay, uh, let me check it. I'm sorry for that.
This is briefly the RAIN platform. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, same as Klaus, because uh, in the, we will present this and then I will ask a little bit about uh, how, how, how really uh, uh, this could be benefiting for, for our stakeholders, for our real entrepreneurs, because this is something that I think they really want to know. The, comp the, the platform is quite complex, quite, quite big, and a lot of research concepts within. So I think we, in a minute, we can talk about this. Now I would pass over to, to Gerhard. Uh, you were responsible for the business transformation platform as well as the networking tool. Uh, I saw on the website, they are really, really interesting and very visual tools. Um, please tell us a little bit about that. Um, how do the platforms work and, and who, should, who should go and, and use them? Yeah, the platforms are two different ones. That's the reason why we have two different tools. The first one is for, we call it usually for advisors. Some people say for entrepreneurs, I don't think so. So it's a database of, about uh, ideas. So I think it fits very nicely to the tools we were looking uh, uh, at before, because it goes a little bit deeper into what could be done. And then it has a second part, which describes or discusses about your ability to really take over one of those uh, ideas. Let me jump in and, and show you some parts of it. Okay. Let me see. So I think you can see the uh, main screen. I have directly jumped into it and you see a lot of pictures. So we think some of the uh, elements we have to develop is that it's a kind of an animating part. You can move over them and in each one of them, you can have a very quick introduction what is behind it. When you click on one of them, you see to the left with the canvas and it tells you where in your uh, uh, business it would make a difference. And then when you um, click on one of those uh, icons, you get more information. I went now into one of those, it's a food assembly, and usually we have two pages, an animating page, and then a page with a lot of uh, cases and general ideas about uh, what could be done. Oh, I have to move some, okay. So you can move around here and uh, uh, another issue you could uh, try to do is say, okay, I'm not interested in everything because this database is growing. I think every week we add one or two more. So what you uh, could do is you to select, you go down maybe to online marketing, then you have a few examples here where the food assembly is there, but there are others elements in there. Let me move to environmental protection. There I have the my newest edition, I'm quite proud of it <laughs> because I found that it's, for example, carbon farming, you know, which is something which is very hot at the moment in the United States, where uh, farmers get some payment uh, for their kind of traditional type of farming when they try to capture CO2 uh, in their soils. So these are some of those issues. Or when we go uh, further down to 
let's say, farm industry collaboration. There were a lot of uh, opportunities uh, producing paper, producing this and that. So this is the basic on which we are working. And then the next part is when we say, okay, we would like to um, I go down to, let's say, online marketing. Um, how does the picture or the, the screen look when we are trying to find out if a model would fit ourselves? Um, we would select a few of them. I select only one of them. And then uh, we move very quickly through. We don't have to look at this part. Then we get to a screen where you can really analyze because it asks for external requirement, it asks for internal requirements. These are the requirements. And then I can go in and maybe put some uh, data from myself in there and say, okay, is it good enough or is it not good enough? And then I can move further. And I think it's a basis for the advisor to enter into a kind of a discussion with an entrepreneur and see, okay, would it fit? Where could we improve? Or should we go back? and try something out, uh, something out differently. So I think that uh, should be for the moment enough for this tool. And now I move to the next one, which is what they call the network tool. It has a completely different focus. Where this first one was more on, okay, getting ideas, trying to move forward, knowing if it's uh, working. The second one is an overview of networks. And there is a question of, uh, about knowing what type of networks are there that fit my interests or what type of networks that fit my interests are available in my region. So I try again to open that screen. Let me see, I think that's the right one. Yeah. It has also two parts. The first part is that it helps you to identify appropriate networks and the second one, which is here listed at concept for network creation, it gives some kind of basic help to develop a network. So we can very quickly look into both of them. The selection of networks. Uh, you see up there to the left, we have a matrix, which is uh, uh, covering uh, various areas. So it looks at food, bio-based activities, ecosystem services, so this was a kind of a matrix we have been using in uh, Rubismo. And then the columns focus on different issues like new models or uh, new products or whatever. So we have to select something here. I select now maybe this one, which uh, is looking for uh, um, using renewable resources and waste. And you can see to the right that there are certain countries where there is certain uh, uh, um, networks. And then we have also uh, further elements which we can use. For example, we can see who is involved in such networks. And you can see here we have different networks, some where only enterprises are working and others where enterprise policy and research is cooperating. So we can uh, work around, but I look now first for, let's say, a country. There were different networks that fit into that cell here. Yeah, that they only send. So maybe we select one or two for moving further, uh, further. So it's up there now in a box. And then I say less, uh, yes, I would also look like to look at uh, some of them uh, where the cooperation, or maybe no, I don't do it. We only look at those where. Um, enterprises and research work together. So we have seven networks in uh, certain countries. So I can select maybe two of them, move forward. And then I get into a, a page where I can have more information about the networks. So the key issue is that I find networks and then I have them and I can look at them and maybe compare them. I can, hear, there are different links. Yeah, there's more information that's a link to uh, the website of those uh, networks, there's a description of the network. Depending on what information is available, there might be three, four or more uh, uh, links here. But we could also say, okay, we want to compare two of them. And when you do it, you get a kind of a detailed comparison and you can go uh, further down. And then what you can do, you can uh, continue and then you get a more detailed summary of the information of the network. So it's a very simple issue. Uh, you look and you find. So it's a, a typical database. 
but then we'll all go to the second part, trying to find some help on how to develop a network where I uh, decided to focus on three issues, organization, management, and services. So when you go into organization, there are different options you can look at. And you can look at in each one of them in detail. And you can see there are different links. You can go in there and, or not and do whatever you want. And then you select one of them. You say, okay, that's one. And then you move forth further to the management part. And there we have also different issues. And the same procedure, you go in there, you can look at some, you have certain links, you can find more information. And here you can select different ones. We want to do, uh, let's say, a sure member involvement. So, and then we move further and then we select certain services. And then uh, at the end, we can print out a kind of a development plan and you have them all together. So uh, I think that's from my side, very quickly, introduction into the two tools. Thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations, they look fantastic. And ex extremely also uh, intuitive and easy to use. I think that is something uh, I would like to discuss with all of you after, after the first round, uh, because uh, what are your experiences also in, in, in testing those tools? What are the feedbacks from, from your end users, from the stakeholders regarding this? So thank you very much for, for that. Uh, Philip. I would like to talk about the uh, Robismo business environment tool. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about that. Uh, who's it for? How's it work? I think you still have the microphone off. Can you check? Yeah, no. So uh, I think the, the, the issue of the business environment as we defined it and the, the importance of the context has already been addressed a few times uh, today. And uh, we basically in the Rubismo project um, took a very straightforward approach. We boiled it down to, I think, uh, three questions more or less, which we wanted to support with this tool to, to find answers. So what business do, yeah, the regions or in the regions aim for and what support do they need? Um, we want to find out how supportive the business environment is actually uh, and compare that with what is actually uh, needed. So to come up with solutions and guidelines, what are we going to do to make the business environment more supportive? And on the right side, you can see one um, result from an analysis of the business environment profiling exercise, which is part of the tool where you see different, um, different businesses that we looked at in Rubismo. And uh, we here I just show one part of the business environment, the part on the technology and knowledge. And you can see the gaps that exist between the needs, which is the blue line and the actual conditions uh, in the red line. And there we, um, move on forward to address exactly this guide, this, this gaps. So it's um, pretty hard to explain this tool in short, but I just want to mention some of the important characteristics. Besides identifying um, the gaps in the business environments, it helps to define measures and guidelines, come up with supportive business environments. And we do this by focusing on capacity factors. So we, we look exactly at what are the strategies in the different parts of the business environment. How do they cooperate not only within these, what we call sub-arenas, for example, technology and knowledge sub-arena, but also across the sub-arenas. We identified this as a very important factor for uh, supportive business environments. And the arenas, the sub-arenas, the tool do, deals with are seven. Uh, these are funding, markets, consumer expectations, the rules and regulations, the resource and infrastructure. I think infrastructure was also mentioned a few times today, the importance of connectivities and so on, rural areas. But there needs to be capacity building, obviously, and this requires training and education based on sound technology and knowledge development. So the format, another characteristic of this tool is the format, which is a workshop format different to the other tools, I guess, that have more um, kind of a, a, an online tool. And um, in view of the, as a reaction to the corona issue, we 
um, developed also an online version of the tool, which allows to include all kinds of stakeholders involved in the business environment. Furthermore, the tool provides a number of support material, including um, manuals. Let me just give you one um, example of a, um, a component here. This is the, um, a mural, which is used as one of the instruments in the tool. Um, and it guides basically the moderators who are conducting these workshops and these tools stepwise through the whole approach uh, and the group works. So um, all of this is very nicely documented in, uh, on the website as well. There are some uh, videos that have been developed and some further material also. Well, um, quickly to summarize, what are the expected, you can expect if you use this tool. You can expect um, to get profiles of business environments. Uh, one core picture is here on the right side. This seven subparinas, the wheel of the business environments, it's, a picture we use a lot. It's very similar to the tool used in the AAP, by the AAP Agri. Um, and in this, in this wheel, you can see how uh, critical some subarenas are compared to others um, in terms of the actions needed. Then the guidelines I mentioned before should also are also an important outcome and the measures. And last but not least, also assigning responsibilities to um, who's going to take action in what regard. So the potential users and users here are basically, I uh, would say all actors who have some influence, some saying in shaping the business environments, but um, more specifically, you could define uh, some more uh, critical important actors. Exemplary guidelines, these are more very general ones which I presented, but within the tool application, we have come up with some very concrete um, guidelines that you can see here, for example, those guidelines we um, try to extract in general for, uh, for the uh, technology and knowledge subarena, including, for example, the need to map all stakeholders with the technological and knowledge expertise. And this should then facilitate science to business and business to business knowledge transfer by creating a, uh, networking opportunities, but also um, facilitate the transfer of knowledge between actors in the sub arena, because often we, find, we encounter cases of silos in, in the business environment. Last but not least, um, to facilitate the participation and, um, of enterprises actually in research and development projects is uh, very crucial. To finalize uh, as an outlook, what is going to happen next with this tool? Um, we have the opportunity to use the tool in some uh, projects which are going on uh, beyond uh, the Rubismo projects such as uh, GoGrass. And uh, so there are several partners involved in those projects which were also participating in, in the development of the tool. Uh, you can see some of the logos here, um, Greenovate, Irish Rulery, Gate to Growth, SLU, ICE, um, EFO Prospects. But more importantly, or not more, but as similarly importantly, it will be to develop a community of practice here together with um, uh, regions and the businesses who use the tool uh, in the next, who will be using the tool in the next years and who will enrich, I think, with their experience also the guidelines um, and can contribute to sharing uh, their lessons with other regions and other uh, yeah, places in Europe. For you, there will be there's, there will be plenty. I hope opportune of opportunities to experience the tool. We will be launching the tool on the 13th of October in a webinar, and uh, first workshop will take place. Um, in using the tool in Sweden in November. Uh, and further workshops are planned for the beginning of uh, 2022. If you are more interested, please uh, visit the link which is provided here for more explanations about the tool. 
and uh, or contact you may contact us we are um, providing an email an email specifically for in tool users but you can also contact us personally the persons who were uh, responsible for this tool development thank you very much back to you that sounds great thank you so much uh, philip I have, I have directly a question for Klaus, but then after this, uh, same question uh, back to Philip, because uh, you are the ones who developed something <clears throat> which, uh, coming from the research background, uh, stays in a very, let's, let's call it, mm, uh, not a very simplified format for the end user. I mean, for sure, the, the, the business model, when you launch it, will be, uh, the, the tool will be easier, but you, you're working with very difficult concepts. Um, how, what were your experience? I mean, uh, you just mentioned in your, in your presentation, your target group, Klaus, what was the target group for creating the, the RAIN business model? And what kind of challenges has you, have you identified in transmitting those concepts to the users, to the target group? Yes, it was a, a real challenge to translate these complex uh, concepts and so on into a usable and feasible uh, system or structure. Uh, so uh, the reaction of our pilot regions was, for example, that it needs a well-founded training of the trainers. So, for example, for a workshop, uh, the trainer or the moderator should be uh, already uh, good informed about this concept. And he can use then uh, specific other tools for support from the RAIN toolbox, where the different tools are structured very well, I think, and in a simple way. Uh, and it's not the uh, uh, it's not uh, to uh, yes it's not uh, necessary to do the full application of this model in in one workshop for example so you take out only one piece of these puzzles when you remember and you work on this piece of the puzzle and it depends then on the time you have for this workshop and which people are attending the workshop how you proceed with this. And you can uh, put the puzzles then in the end together, and then you have a, a more or less good business plan, which uh, fills more or less all these uh, different requirements, I think. Thank you. Philip, your experience, uh, was it difficult to, to, I mean, you still have the workshops coming up, if you said, but how are you dealing with this? Um, your end users are, um, when you're uh, presenting research concepts, when you're presenting a new concept, is it easy for, for you to, to relate uh, to the end users and to transmit all your uh, concepts? No, in fact, not always, but um, as uh, mentioned already by Justin in the initial session, we didn't want to, we didn't have to always reinvent the wheel. So for example, uh, some of the tools, some of the forms, um, we adopted or adapted them to the AAP Agri tools, uh, for example, for rural, for creating rural visions and so on. Uh, but I would fully agree with, with Klaus, um, there needs to be some kind of um, training of the moderators. And we had a work package um, in the project doing this. So um, I think we, we, we managed to, to, to provide a, a quite slim tool in terms of the, 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 theoretical background, which is there and all the conceptual things. Um, uh, the whole online, um, let's say digitalization zone helped us very much also to make use of videos um, to understand so, so that the participants already in advance before you doing the workshop can get a, a good idea about, about the concepts uh, that, that are behind that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, exactly. We, we're going to talk about uh, this as well in a minute, the, the capacity building and the, the required capacities from our, our target groups, from our users. Before that, I have a question for Alexander and for Gerhard. You both uh, have developed tools which actually allow business models, uh, business model analysis, which is something that is very, very important for us because uh, what we're trying to do is not to, to give uh, inspiration, to give best practices, and also to, to give uh, a certain amount of... Uh, of um, uh, idea of what is possible. How did you? How did you feel? Uh, how? What were the user feedback from from your target group using those tools? I know, for example, also that uh, Rubismo and uh, the business tool they have open forms in order to receive new uh, new business models uh, when they want to present themselves. So, 
what was the feedback uh, after you launched the, the tools for, for the business models analysis specifically? Alexandra, you first. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in order to, to test all of these tools in the RAIN platform, uh, two series of workshops uh, had taken place with a really big help of the pilot regions. So, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, policymakers in the field of, uh, uh, in the rural uh, field, they uh, had the opportunity to test uh, those tools and give us uh, feedback, uh, specifically about the business model, uh, the, the feedback that we got was actually quite good. Uh, it's really simple. It's uh, done through a questionnaire. So you, the, the, the user has just to answer a couple of questions and then uh, they can uh, have the overall analysis, a detailed analysis of their business plan uh, based on the living lab approach, the economic sustainability, social sustainability and ecological sustainability. Uh, this means that uh, the user that uh, answers the, the, the questionnaire has the opportunity to find the weaknesses and the strengths in their business plan and finally to improve and make it uh, as, as good as possible for, for the purposes of uh, his or her business. Uh, so this is mainly how, how we proceeded to see if, we, if this actually works and we are very happy to see that uh, the results were quite, uh, quite good. Thank you. Yeah, maybe add something to it. Uh, I had some ambitions behind the development and we had quite some discussion inside the project. What uh, level of abstraction should we deliver? And I was the one who was fighting for lower levels, despite the fact that I'm coming from the universities. But uh, I think it's a huge gap between what we are doing in universities when we talk about uh, models and uh, whatever and abstract uh, formulations uh, to what is really uh, needed on the ground. So, um, okay, we develop what we develop. And there is an ambition behind it. And the ambition means that we say we have to push. I think the time is over of this old fashioned traditional agriculture that's still there. But when you look at the young farmers everywhere, yeah, there are new uh, things developing. And, I just tell you, uh, read the newspapers. Yeah, things are developing everywhere. And I think one of our ideas was to capture what is coming out everywhere. United States, Netherlands, in all those different countries, new movements are developing and put them there. And then it's easy to really distribute. For me, it was really striking when I was presenting the tool to advisors in, in Germany. 30% uh, of the models or examples I had never heard about. And I think that's one of our de uh, deficiencies uh, because there are so many things and new things developing and it's a question of spreading. So that was part of uh, the discussion. And then this add on for a quick analysis. Okay, it's a dirty analysis. So it's very quick to see, okay, does it fit, does it not fit? Uh, and uh, I think that's more kind of expert knowledge that has been built in. So it's not really proven through statistical analysis or whatever. But it gives the first quick hint, and I think that's important to have a quick and dirty uh, focus and then go into deeper discussions with advisors who discuss with you what needs to be done. That's very great. Thank you very much, because it's uh, one of the keywords. And this is I want to put back to, to Thomas and, and to Alexandra. Uh, you were responsible in the projects, and both of them, uh, for building capacity, for seeing what is necessary. So, uh, Gerhard just mentioned, there's a huge gap. Uh, between what we're doing and what is actually needed. And maybe we have to meet somewhere in the middle. So where do you see, for example, in, in your experience in the projects, where you see what are the real capacities needed to, to treat on and where maybe they were um, short and how did you uh, solve this? So what exactly did you do in order to close uh, this, this gap? I don't know if you want to start, Alexandra. So about the, the, the labor project and the, the RAIN platform uh, more specifically, uh, in order to build capacity, in my opinion, the most important is uh, to inter internationalize the businesses in uh, the rural areas and also give the opportunity to uh, entrepreneurs in this field to gain uh, new knowledge and uh, skills. 
Uh, this is how uh, we intend to fill this gap with uh, the RAIN platform and the tools that they are integrated in it. Uh, first of all, with uh, the RAIN community, uh, which is uh, one of the parts of uh, the RAIN platform through which uh, the registered members of uh, the registered members of, uh, of the platform, they can interact uh, between each other, they can uh, communicate, share ideas, uh, share best practices, uh, and go go further, go, go to be international and uh, gain new knowledge on how the businesses in rural areas work in other European countries. Uh, about the skills and uh, knowledge uh, gap that may exist, and uh, as uh, uh, as already was mentioned, the, 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 the rural businesses uh, have to now be developed more and more and be more connected to innovation and technology. Uh, here comes uh, the knowledge sharing uh, that we have in our platform. Uh, there are several MOOCs uh, developed uh, as well as some webinars uh, where uh, the users can just enter educate themselves on different topics and uh, also in order to justify that all this uh, was gained, we have, uh, they have the opportunity to also to get a certificate on that. Uh, so this is mainly and briefly how, how we try to fill this gap through, through this RAIN uh, platform. I um, couldn't, couldn't uh, agree more. <laughs> what I maybe should add to the story is what I put in the chat before here, and just also comes close to, to what some of the previous speakers have said, we have to be very close to the businesses. We have to be there. And that's one of the reasons why we, as a project, decided to go for very, for, for each partner to develop their, their, the instrument they needed in their context. When we have these European projects, we very often appreciate a mix of type of partners in the project. And that, that is fruitful in many ways, but when it comes down to a specific country in a specific context, we need to have, we, we, they have different kind of context in their own world. So we needed to be very flexible in, in what format we approach the different uh, actors in our different countries. Um, and I think that was, uh, was the key. Uh, added to that, in terms of what is needed in the, in the geographical regional setting, I added, as I said in the chat, that uh, we need more entrepreneurial bureaucrats. We need people in uh, the, the support system, in the business environment, as you said, that are able to act as entrepreneurs from their respective position, uh, to combine resources, to find new ways, to go an extra mile when they're supporting their entrepreneurs or supporting their politicians in that, in that sense also, because many of the public civil servants need to support the politicians and find uh, new ways in, uh, to sort of educate them and to, to get the right policies in place in the local context. Maybe that's kind of an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander and, and Thomas. Maybe one last question about this, this, this topic, because uh, it was something that uh, I think we saw. I, I want to know also from Provismo how he dealt with this. Um, of course, we are multi-actor project and we have a lot of, of network and we created a lot of tools and most of them are available in English as well as the training was in English. How did you see the issue of, of language and approachability uh, inside of the project? If I start there, uh, I would say that we, we, we very early on found that we can't have teaching material in English when we meet our local entrepreneurs. Some of them, of course, I mean, some of them are very educated. They differ between regions, countries, and so on. But uh, that's why we also, I think, which I think is a, a good thing now. We, on our platform, on the Rubism website, you can find a training platform, the e-learning, um, where you have material in different languages because the partners upload it in their own language. Uh, so to make it available, to make the knowledge available, you can't expect them to have a knowledge in English. I think that's a uh, key. Uh, and it, that goes as well for many of the civil servants. You don't train them in English. You don't, you need to have, you need to understand uh, and, and develop, conceptualize models locally, conceptualize what they need locally. And then that includes a language, I think. Alexandra, language and life roar. Rural areas and piloting. How did it work out for you? You were in charge of, of, of overseeing all the workshops, the training activities. How did you feel about it? 
and learn the language, it was quite a big barrier, I have to admit. Um, well, using English during the workshops didn't work in uh, some of the areas. And uh, of course, this also was depending on the profile of uh, the participants of these workshops. And uh, well, it's uh, since we want to uh, also focus uh, regionally, I think we also need to consider the language barriers that uh, they exist and uh, trying to find solutions on that. Uh, we try to, uh, let's say, translate the RAIN platform on the, or the main, uh, the main uh, aspects and features of the RAIN platform. Uh, it was uh, quite a good job. There were some uh, weak points that they were mentioned during this workshop. So this is uh, how we try to solve this and uh, um, spotted this, uh, these points and change them so everyone can have access uh, in their, uh, at least uh, some of the languages uh, that exist in, uh, in Europe. So um, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a big challenge and uh, it's definitely something that needs to be considered in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to move on uh, to uh, coming back on the, on the call topics. Uh, and this is for, for, for Klaus and Gerhard in this regard. You working with the, with the business models analysis and everything. Uh, one of the issues was how we are dealing with rural economic diversification. How did you see the diversification uh, achieved and regarding specifically uh, uh, your analysis and your models that you created? How you saw, how you see this in Europe? How you see this in rural areas that you uh, 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 try to try to research. Is it is it in a good way? You said that there are a lot of good initiatives. You can see movement. Is it enough? Uh, are, are they already doing something and just need a little support of us? Or how do you see that? Should I start? Maybe I start. Uh, uh, okay, I have a certain opinion. Also, when you look at the models webinar tool, many of them are linked to processing. So what is happening is that we get some kind of, re, I call it re-industrialization of the rural area. Uh, okay, it's usually small elements because there are some basic processing and then there may be direct sales, online sales to the customer or whatever. But this uh, getting industry back to the rural areas, I think is one of those big challenges. And I have in a different uh, uh, um, issue, I've discussed this in a little bit more detail. Uh, for example, when you pr produce grass and you make paper out of grass, where would you place processing? It doesn't make to put processing in a city because you have the bulk product, it's grass. So you would try to put the processing into the, into the uh, uh, rural area. And I think it's in many of those developments we see at the moment. So it's more a question of, uh, and I think it has been discussed, of providing the infrastructure in the rural areas so that processing is able to move back. That has to do with internet, that has to do with roads, that has to do with schools. And if that is not there, okay, this development will not take place because there's a barrier. But the economics, the economics, and I think that's an important part, the economics, uh, uh, are, how do you say, provide a push toward moving back into rural areas, at least when it comes to food processing and those new developments we experience also at the moment. Thank you, yes, maybe to add, what we learned in the regions is, in the rural regions is, that there are really a lot of very diverse activities, a lot of good ideas, but of course in rural regions you have a low population density and often it depends only on one person. One person is a driver of a good activity and if the situation of this one person changes for illness or family situation, job changes and so on, this whole activity it stops and and goes down so it it's uh, we think it's really necessary to connect people to have a, a higher potential that people come together and it didn't it doesn't depend only on one person to make the activities more resilient and sustainable in various way this is my point thank you Klaus, and thank you again philip does the, the, the Robismo tools that you created, 
Are they helping with the resilience of uh, the rural areas in Europe? How do you face the, the upcoming challenges? Maybe how, how do you see uh, the businesses in rural Europe after COVID? Uh, uh, are we right now at the exact uh, right uh, point in the right, exactly right time? Uh, did, we, did we do everything right in order to provide uh, now the support tools which are necessary? Well, I, I don't dare to, to say this for all the tools. I would just uh, refer to, to the business environment support tool, which, which has, a, I think, a quite, quite um, ex ante component. So it, it is looking at what do we need in the future, actually, where are we standing now, what was in the past, but how do we have to shape uh, the businesses and the business environments in the future? And I think the, the, the best way to tackle this is by... by uh, having interactions between the stakeholders in such kind of, of workshops. And um, related to your previous question, I think this workshop tool really offers the possibility to bring stakeholders from different, not only um, businesses and sectors, but also from different regions and countries at a higher level. So we, we are, for example, um, exploring the possibility to use this tool even in Korea. Um, so the, the language there isn't, and there are, there are some other barriers, obviously, but I think it's, um, it's we, we have the tools, I think, to, to at least uh, support these challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, maybe it would be interesting to hear others' opinion on this. Yeah. Absolutely. For the others, how do you see that? Uh, the tools that you created, uh, are there right now uh, the exact right ones that are needed? Uh, do we need to adjust them after we saw what the, the last year and a half? Um, how do you see them? Are they flexible enough uh, to, to survive? Especially right we see, uh, for example, when Alexia was talking about the flagship platform, everything, um, do they have to change or, or how do you see that? Can I start with it? I consider the combination of the tools extremely important. I was just thinking when we had this discussion, why don't we place them on a common platform? Because we can use them in a kind of a sequence. Okay, maybe uh, I take not just my tool, okay, you uh, jump into something, people get ideas, then they go into the environment tool, etc., and then look what needs to be done, etc. And also with the uh, tools we have been hearing from uh, the other projects. I think what we needed to do is to develop a kind of a, a proposal of how to use those tools in a certain sequence, one after the other. And then I think we get a kind of a, a tool landscape uh, which is much more than an individual tool. I completely agree with you. <laughs> Just one word. Uh, I think there Please. are already so many tools everywhere to find when you look at the web. So it's difficult for people to find the right tool. So it, it's really good to have a good guideline which tool for what. That's the difficulty, I think because the people are maybe already overloaded with tools. Uh, in a way, we have, uh, we have a good example of how what has to happen in our chat, where one of our participants says, I would like to use these tools in, as a change agent in a local regional setting. That's what we need. <laughs> that, that's the energy that, that to, to be able to make sort of business of supporting businesses. Because otherwise we can't we can't always keep keep supporting businesses with, with uh, public funds. Those are going to be extended. We need to, to make sure that we can make business in supporting businesses, and that's what Sibel is, is saying, and that's what we need to do. And that's why I think it's very important that we try try to. I mean, the the only way the tools are like putting them in the library, like a book. You need to work with them, uh, employ them, uh, use them. Um, that's when it happens. The tools don't make a difference. Sorry. <laughs> well said, well said, well said. No, it's true. We're counting really on this because uh, we haven't talked yet about sustainability. That might be a different uh, discussion uh, still, but um, what we're counting on right now is exactly that. We have a, a common platform in the future which helps us, and we are the ones who are supposed to to provide also uh, guidelines uh, now to use that. And I want to use the opportunity to give everybody the opportunity to have two sentences maximum, a small pitch of who and why should they use your tool? We start with Klaus. 
So I think regional consultants should use our tool to, to submit or to, to make aware the complexity of the situation and to, to use all the regional sources and potentials. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Alexa, Alexandra, pero. <laughs> So from, uh, from one side, uh, rural entrepreneurs, in order to uh, international, internationalize their businesses and also uh, help them improve and uh, grow bigger. And also, uh, I would say also researchers and policy makers in order to see all this uh, uh, relevant information that uh, is on the platform and make the connection with uh, the rural businesses, something that is really, really important uh, in my point of view as uh, rural businesses are mostly connected uh, with being far from technology. So I think that uh, they, they should be aware that uh, such a platform exists also for them. Wonderful. Yeah, you have actually four sentences since you have two tools. <laughs> no, it's my turn. Okay, maybe uh, I think we're still in a push situation, not so much in a pull situation. So uh, I think we have to get things out. And uh, I consider most of them as kind of an eye opener to see the potential and to help people to get out of their usual ways. And I think by seeing potentials in whatever we have uh, discussed here, uh, the regions will develop uh, and uh, uh, we can get into completely different futures. I think it's not just small, you know, I had one discussion with advisors that yes, but when we are discussing now with uh, our people, they want to improve a little bit here and a little bit there. But that's not what we are up to. We say, okay, open up to new developments. Thank you so much. Philip. So yeah, visit the tool. And I think uh, you will not only find some guidance for how to develop supportive business environment, but you will also find uh, some inspirations uh, on how to create new approaches for your business environment. Thank you very much. And we have Thomas, last but not least. You have to, sorry, microphone. I'm not a father of any of the tools, but uh, I would say, uh, yeah, keeping that local perspective on local development uh, and supporting that connectivity uh, with um, with uh, the embeddedness, try helping businesses to embed in the in both the local setting and the global setting. Thank you so much. Just to wrap up before Daniel cuts me off. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It was a great round. Uh, I think you did a wonderful job, all of you, uh, to create something extremely useful. I think we have learned that we were not the ones who invented the wheel uh, completely new, but we used what is, was available. We put it further, we created something extremely valuable, and we really, really hope uh, this goes to Alexia and all our colleagues to make use of our tools. We will do our part for sure. We make sure that they are sustainable from our part. We make sure to push them out, but we need this kind of uh, common platform, common way of promoting them, and then uh, we will make sure that there will be guidelines, there will be uh, manuals, there will be support of using those tools. For sure, we will do projects where there will be capacity building behind. So really, 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 we hope that this will be a, a great start for everybody. This is there, there's everybody to use. They're not secrets, they're all public. Please use the tools, put all your questions to us and we will try to help you with ever what business or every need you have in your rural area. So thank you very much for the session and, and uh, well, Good day.